is that the boot of injustice is pressing down so hard、mm. on so many groups of people's throats,、mm. and it will not let off unless we have leaders who really take a stand on that type of injustice, right? Yeah. From people not accessing healthcare, who can't bury their children when they're dead, who are hungry, who don't have shelter, who don't have clothing. These are facets of life that should be. Provided or rights for human beings, right? Because、yeah. that is necessary to live a meaningful life. Yeah, you know, and When you're then, no longer worried about the basic necessities. Exactly right. Because then you get to try to put forth that creativity, that ingenuity,、yeah. that intelligence, that drive, the resilience to be the best of who you are. Dr. Dave Nyack, welcome to the show. It's been a long time coming. I know we've been following each other for a hot minute now,、um, and to be honest, it, it usually takes me a while to get that spark of curiosity. Otherwise, I don't think it'd be a, a genuine or authentic show on my behalf, at least. And、uh, so, welcome.、Um, I'm glad to have you. It's been, I know you're you're busy. We're both busy and to make time for. Hopefully,、uh, probably a meaningful, deep conversation.、I'm、looking forward to it. Victor, thank you so much for having me. It's just a true honor. I'm very humbled to be a part of your show. I am just so grateful for the work that you do to tell stories of people who are giving back to their communities, giving back to their environments in ways and shapes and forms that we don't see too often. And、mm-hmm. I think you're shining a light on that, and I appreciate、yeah. that. Thank you. It's、uh, it's been a recent kind of not maybe turn of events in the sense of like I really previously with this show wanted to extract as much value from every guest, but more recently it's more so I just want to learn about people. Whether or not I extract value from that person is could be at the cherry on top if anything comes from it. And so with the many hats、um, you're wearing, I, I want to know kind of the, the human and the spirit. The essence, like behind everything that's driving, what seems like a well-oiled machine, and to give people an idea,、uh, whether it's your strength to love foundation, you and you have a free allergy and asthma clinic, and、uh, what neighborhood is that in? In the Roscoe neighborhood village. The, the Roscoe, yeah,、okay, so it's Roscoe on Belmont、village. Avenue and Levitt, and we started in 2019. With the fundamental purpose that healthcare is a human right for all, and、yeah. uh, I've been in Chicago here for two decades or so, and I did all my training here, and so you get to、mm-hmm. know not only communities but at-risk communities too. Being trained at UIC、uh, and Rush Medical Center, you know, you you see a tremendous amount of patients who are extremely disadvantaged who are going through. Um, tremendous challenges because、yeah. they are of lower socioeconomic,、uh, you know, groups, and it changes you. It changes you as a person, especially as you're training. It, it does. And on top of that, you've affected change within the community that have been affected by gun violence.、Um, you and then most recently, what I learned is this: you have a farm. <laughs> We are so yes. So I, you're absolutely right.、Uh, I'm a physician. I'm a farmer. I'm an activist. I wear many hats, but really, and they're you know, all simultaneous. Yes, yes. And you wear many hats, but really, you're all the same person.、Right? Yeah. At the end of the day, we fundamentally look at, you know, our community, our neighbors, and actively seek to reduce their pain, because、That's、what I found. Is that everybody's in pain? What I've been recently iterating to the students in the EMT class is that you do not have to be a healthcare provider to help people, and because they all want to help people,、um, and, and my purpose with this class is to help shine a light on if healthcare is the vessel that they want to help people through, and you know majority of them do,、um, but there are some that that don't,、um, and、uh, you're just a beacon of an example of of that. Oh, thanks, Victor. Honestly, I'm just trying to be a good neighbor. That's it, honestly. And I think that we, as a society, and I don't want to generalize, but、mm. I do think that we have somewhat 
gone away from that principle. You know, only one or two or three generations ago, you didn't have to have the same last name in the neighborhood if you lost your spouse, that everybody would contribute to mm-hmm. watch your children, bring you food, yeah. help you, you know, get on your feet again, right? Yeah. And now in culture, it's 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 hard to find those people. And, you know, a lot of a lot of others say, well, it's just a more egocentric approach. But actually, I've looked at it from a, another, another viewpoint, that maybe this has centralized around pain, right? That, I don't know about you, but if I'm in pain, the only thing I think about is trying to reduce my pain. Yeah. And it's very hard for me to empathize or to me sympathize with others because I'm in pain. You get that you know, sympathetic drive, right? You know, your blood pressure goes up, yeah. your heart rate goes up, you sweat, it's difficult to sleep. And then on top of that, the psychological burden that comes with that too. Mm. And what happens is that your life changes and it's difficult to try to lend a helping hand to For somebody sure. else. And pain comes from many causes, whether it's like deep systemic issues that are still have yet to be fixed or it could be the acute pandemic that recently and it's apparently coming back (laughs) yeah yeah and i think you know since 2020 we've we've really changed as a society yeah right when i agreed but the comments that i'm reading about when people hear about another booster shot they're very reluctant actually there's so how much change has actually happened as far as culture and perspective on things like vaccines yeah so i mean given so i'm an allergy immunology specialist i'm board certified and so one of the areas of expertise is vaccines Mm. you know how they work how they're developed what it does to your immune system to protect you from diseases whether that be you know viruses things like that what i will say is this uh and and rightfully so i think the you know, March 2020 through that spring Mm -hmm. and summer was a very atypical situation for the general public, not knowing, you know, what are the consequences. And then you see quite a bit of, you know, the, the death and the pain via media, social media, et cetera. It scares people. When, when the the CDC wavers on their protocols, it, it, I think it cultivates a lot of mistrust. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. And let's, let's be clear too. You know, for me, I have always respected the autonomy of my patients. Right. Mm. So for example, I've had many patients, you know, come to me who have a curable cancer Mm. and say, you know what, doc, I don't want the treatment. And I say to them, Absolutely. That's your choice. As long as you know the risks and the benefits, you're decisional. Mm. And you'll have family members come to me and, hey, Dr. Dave, like, I need for you to convince, you know, so-and-so right. to take this treatment. It's curable. Why wouldn't they do it? And you have to explain to them and say, look, everybody is, if you're of capacity, right, yeah. able to decide for themselves what they want to do with their bodies. And I think that has to be respected. So, for example, look, at the end of the day, if a treatment is available or a preventative measure like a vaccine and you don't want to take it, that's your decision. And I think people and entities and, you know, large institutions and, you know, society should, should at least consider in that realm. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, that's something that's been a really hot topic when you're talking about boosters and things like that, I think. Well, I mean, the people that are, pro vaccine are offended because they're like you're hurting my, the chances of my family member you're increasing the risk that my family members can get sick and that's true and i think um these are the risks mm. right i think as long as we know the risks and the benefits yeah. of you know not taking the vaccine versus taking it and what natural immunity versus you know induced immunity from a vaccine There's is that perspective these are too. these are important things to sort of iron out and Again, at the end of the day, you should be able to do what you want to do with your body. Mm -hmm. I think that is a human right. Now, there are circumstances, you know, when that can change in capacity and situations when there's acute illness, things like that too, right? But overall, I think for myself, 
coming into the fall, you see these sort of news stories about, you know, COVID going up and down and left and right. Yeah. You know, it can get overwhelming. And I think that's exactly what happened during the spring and summer of 2020. You just become so overwhelmed because it's just a, honestly, like a diarrhea of news information. Mm -hmm. Every single day you turn on the news and they have the death rate and the number of cases on the daily. And it becomes so exhausting you're operating out of fear then right? that's exactly right you're in a chronic sympathetic overdrive mm -hmm. and it can come to a point where you're just like you know what i've had enough of this mm -hmm. i just want to live my life you know and and yeah. i don't blame that yeah i i think my motto at the moment is control what you can control mm -hmm. and kind of don't worry about the things out of your control but then the other thing to remain humble is just like you know what you know and you don't know what you don't yeah. know right? yeah i mean look i'm a vaccine specialist i think that um, you know, just like we, I recommend to my patients during the, you know, fall and winter months to get a flu shot. Yeah. The same thing I would recommend for a COVID shot. Yeah. You know, these are, you know, during the winter months, we have an increase in, you know, respiratory related diseases. I guess the the other thing was just like how expedited the creation of the vaccine. Yes. That scared a lot of people. Just like, well, you just came oh. out of this with nowhere? Not trusting big pharma and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And, and you know, I would I would say this. Technology is deflationary, mm -hmm. right? You know, I could pull out our smartphone that you have right here. You know, a decade ago, and to decade now later, we have a camera, uh, your television, your yeah. email, your computer. Three cameras. Three cameras. Your measuring <laughs> tape is in there now, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, what, what over time, how quickly technology deflates mm. and and just like in the price structure right how much was a plasma tv 10 years ago mm. and how much one is a same size television now That's insane, yeah. so similarly you're, you're also seeing this effect in medicine in general technological advances in therapeutic measures right mm. And I think that's something that may have caught the general population off guard, right? Mm. Of to see, for example, cancer therapies, right? Many cancers that are, and, and first I want to just preface this by cancer knocks at everybody's door. Mm. Doesn't matter whether you're rich, poor, black, white, gay, straight, cancer knocks at everybody's door in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's you personally affected or your family, your friends, your coworker, even your pet. Mm. And that's an area of focus of, of many people and institutions in terms of both treatments, right? But also you can you lose, use the flip side too on, you know, profits too. Yeah. Um, but my point is, is that in, in the cancer world, the technology is really really deflationary mm. and so that going back to the vaccines right they've had this technology that was available yet it didn't have funding and once the technology and the funding was there from the government it was really ramped Why up don't quickly. they share that on the news right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I mean, if you look at, let's say, Moderna has been in business for many years, right? And they've worked on many different types of technologies, mRNA, vaccines, etc. And, you know, it's not, it's not cheap to develop this stuff, right? Mm. You know, and so I think it was a sort of right time, right place, right? You had a pandemic that uh, with a, a virus that nobody understood. And the technology was available with the brains, too, because these are very bright people who are creating and working at these companies. And then you, you actually had a essentially a very uh, expeditious way of tapping into other minds, too, mm. from both private and public sector, mm. which, are, which usually tends to be the right way of doing things, right? You have right. the private sector structure coupled with a public source of funding. Mm. and you combine R related this. to research exactly or? right yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i think that's what really expedited now did it did it happen very quickly sure i guess i guess yeah even if the technology was there don't you need time to gather data though absolutely and i couldn't agree with you more we and, and these are and, and i'll talk about a little bit more about our programs too that we absolutely start in terms of like a pre-pilot method, right? Mm -hmm. A small amount of, you know, participants, you know, looking at the data, seeing what you did right in terms of your experimental method, making changes, and then going back 
and then redoing this again and again and mm-hmm. again until you actually, you know, do it on a large scale where the number is significant and it gets peer reviewed and mm-hmm. goes through different regulatory bodies. And but yeah, they you're right. They skipped many different parts of that. Yeah. And it's only a natural reaction to say, look, we've had these frameworks for many years in our government, regulatory bodies who conduct scientific research. And then all of a sudden in six, eight months, you're coming out with a mass produced vaccine and you're asking me to take it. Mm-hmm. It's only natural for somebody to be leery. Yeah. So uh, given the uh, acknowledging the mistrust, why do you think the CDC you know, announced the, the decisions they did that added to the mistrust. So for example, sharing how like N95s improved your chances of like um, stopping the spread, but then not teaching people how to wear an N95. Um, we all have to get fitted as a healthcare provider for N95s, facial hair, things like that. And then also after the shelves were empty of n 95 they're like, actually your surgical masks are fine. You don't have to, because healthcare providers couldn't even get their hands on an N95 at that point. So we were yeah. so depleted. So yeah. then, then people at the top were like, well, you're good with your surgical mask. Don't, don't continue to buy those N95s because we secretly need it for our healthcare providers. I think, you know, I think you're really, in, and I completely agree and, you know, want to talk about the herd effect because mm. as if, for example, you know, the hurricane that's coming through Florida right now, yeah. you know, naturally when hurricanes come, the first thing you see is long lines for gas stations. Yeah. All of the water and toilet paper all are gone from the store. Toilet paper for yeah. COVID. <laughs> right, right. It's all gone. <laughs> and, you know, you have that mentality. Oh, my neighbor's getting gas and he's getting water. And I see my, you know, Johnny down the street's doing that. Why am yeah. I not doing that? Yeah. And, and I think that's absolutely what happened just on a really exponential level throughout the entire, not only nation, but the world. Yeah. Because this was a very highly... Um, transmissible illness that was spreading very quickly. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think in those sort of times, people acted irrationally. Mm. You know what I mean? And, and, And one of the consequences of that was the fact that we just, you know, on the supply side, didn't produce as many masks for the purpose of, uh, for For everyone, for everyone, to be honest. You know what I mean? I mean, look how easy it is to source masks now, surgical masks. Right. I mean, versus what was done in April of 2020 yeah. and how people took advantage of that. People started making their own. Not know. only that, I mean, you had these healthcare, per, like healthcare companies who would charge 10X right. oh, because they yeah. knew companies would pay for this Yeah, and price gouging people. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and putting things on eBay and like... Now, as far as mandating vaccines, like healthcare providers were put in a hard spot. If, if you know, speaking of autonomy, if they didn't feel comfortable, now they have to. They're at risk of leaving their job, or yeah. getting pushed out. Yes. So, I think I would defer to you know institutional regulations, yeah. right? So, like for example, during my medical training and working in hospitals, uh, you know, being an attending a physician in in let's say the VA hospital where I worked, you had to have. You had to have the, the, the flu vaccine every year. Mm-hmm. And to be mm-hmm. honest, if you're having patient care and you're a provider uh, during a high flu season, it makes sense, right? Because right. what happens is that you are putting not only yourself at risk, right? Because having a staff worker who's out sick really can affect patient care, especially mm-hmm. if you're a critical staff member, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, you know, you're putting other patients at risk too, especially, I, I always say this too, you know, I look at patients... Typically, as like you know, in an immune system framework, because I'm an immunologist, right? So, if you if your immune system is weak, right, and we can have it weak in immune systems in many different areas of life, even as you get older, your mm. immune system just doesn't work as well. But if you're like on cancer therapy and things like that, these weaken your immune system, right? And what it does is that your immune system is like I call it your armor, mm. and this armor really helps fight bacteria, viruses, and fungi. You know, and when you have a weakened armor, you just become more susceptible to these diseases. And so, you know, it's a special group of people because you have to be careful, right? You really have to be careful. I wonder if the CDC framed it that in that perspective of like, take this because you're protecting yourself rather mm-hmm. than protecting other people. 
And look, I think we can both have a discussion on marketing and branding <laughs> because clearly, you know, we, we do have some government entities that just don't do it well, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and you wonder why they don't, you know, outsource these things to really reputable, you know, and, and thinking yeah. about that message, Agencies, yeah. you know? The, uh, like move, you're moving laterally, like the other silly thing after the fact is like mandating masks within restaurants. Like restaurants were closing left and right, and the ones that survived had to put up with like while you're at your table, when you're not eating, keep the mask on. When you're eating, feel free to take it off. And uh, silly, the act of eating or sneezing or laughing at your table, you're still like dispersing yeah particular i mean let's be honest uh you and me go to restaurants because we want to engage in socialization relationships and also enjoy the food Mm -hmm. right and if that experience has been compromised by limiting behaviors it's going to put another sort of question in people's mind is it worth going out Mm -hmm. to do that and we saw that too in the early stages of the pandemic was to say look Firstly, the early stages, there was, you know, a mandatory closing of, of basically everything. Mm-hmm. All commerce was closed. And then you had restaurants. What, what about the, and the rebuttal to that was like, what about like the big box stores? Like right. Walmart and Target. Essential like, workers. Like, come on. Yes, I know. I know. And, and, you know, it was unfortunate because I think if you look back retrospectively, yeah. you know, critical things like schools um, should not have been closed so mm. abruptly because that critical time for socialization education Mm. but also the fact of like what schools bring to a large group of our american school children breakfast lunch yeah yeah in 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 simple terms like i initially thought of it as like daycare essentially but it's so much more than that because as an as an educator you start seeing almost like the lack of critical thinking skills with the students that kind of grew up during the pandemic Absolutely. So I, I'm actually now referring to those children as Gen ISO mm. and ISO for isolation, mm. you know, and I think that I'm seeing this both not only as a parent, but as a clinician and also, you know, just anecdotally in, in general, you know, society is that that was a critical time, especially those, you know, kids in a very important uh developmental phase of their life whether Mm -hmm. that be you know language expression Mm -hmm. reading writing arithmetic or even if you put things in terms of like let's say early adolescence right um freshman year of high school and then you you have like a college cohort too right the college experience and so like everybody during this time period was dramatically affected in terms of what i'm saying the youth and you're seeing that too. But so I had two children. I have two children, Dave Jr. and Lily. They're they're 11 and nine. They're going into sixth and fourth grade. So during that time, uh, you know, Lily was in first grade and David was in third. And coming, you know, that that fall. So when March, they were kindergarten and second. And you know, these are critical times for figuring out how to read, mm. how to write, how to add, and. If it's difficult for a child to have that attention span on an iPad, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a kindergarten teacher. I'm going to be the first to tell you that. <laughs> They're a special, special group. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And especially having 20, 25, you know, five-year-olds. At the same time, yeah. At the same time is you have to be, you know, you're, you're a special person. Mm-hmm. And I think that really contributed to a lot of stunting of normal Mm. progression and i think you're seeing that not only in future years now and i and i had said that in the beginning of the pandemic i said look this is going to be a multi-decade impact did that pull you or your wife out of work so it made us lean in actually Mm. because during that time we were you know getting the foundation up and running Mm. clinic and then we saw this huge need for treatment of uninsured people Mm. so many people either you know went to a more um workforce that was um you know not covered under insurance right a a more um you know work 
centered environment that couldn't have benefits. And mm-hmm. so in addition to having, you know, a large majority of our patients who either were undocumented or are undocumented, we started to actually see a lot more professionals. Uh, like specifically maybe hospitality? Yeah, or, yeah, you know? absolutely. So people... I'm, in, I'm uninsured right now. Yeah, oh, and, and we can talk about that because the restaurant industry, mm-hmm. right? People in, um, you know... Uh, areas of workforce, so for example, coming off of your parents' insurance, yeah. right? Kids who are like 25, 26. Then you had, um, you know, those who, you know, Uber drivers, things like that mm. too, you know? Yeah. And and it was a really amazing opportunity because yeah. I told my wife, I said, you know... Gig workers. Exact gig yeah. workers, exactly right. And I said, there's just a huge demand because of our specialty. We treat a lot of lung disease, whether it's asthma, COPD, and obviously COVID was primarily in the lungs. So we t- treated a lot of post COVID patients, right? Mm. And it just became really rewarding where we were blessed to facilitate a lot of industry contacts and who would donate samples. And then we had a wonderful relationship with a, a family owned pharmacy who would give us price breaks on inhalers. And then, getting re- relationships with like our, our lab core and then, mm. you know, hospitals to provide imaging and way lead, way led to way. Right. Wow. And then word got around and more people call in. And it's, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm the janitor, the <laughs> nurse, the <laughs> physician, and sometimes, you know, I'm the plumber in our clinic, you know, it's just me literally, because yeah. you have to understand it was impossible to find people to work. So I said, you know what, I'll just do everything. Yeah. And yes, I could, I had, I saw less patients, but it was actually really rewarding because it was such a differing perspective of patient care. I got to spend a long time with my patients. And isn't that what you were expecting yes. as a pre-med? Yes, I did. I didn't think that there was this sort of expectation that you would have to see, you know, as many patients as you can spend a myriad of time of patient documentation. Wow. You know, and then going home and still doing patient and, documentation. And trying to implement change. It's so bureaucratic. It is. I, I, but I will say that's a, that's a extreme fault of mm-hmm. the medical system we have in, our, mm-hmm. in, in America. Uh, physicians and mid-level practitioners and, um, you know, other healthcare workers are so inundated with paperwork, with risk management, with um, tasks that take away from direct patient care. Yeah. You've seen systematically over the years that that time with direct patient care has gone down and down and down. And that's the reason why we got into this, right? Is to, you know, heal those yeah. who are in pain. And to do that, we have to be in front of them. We have to talk to them. We have to touch them. We have to work with them. And we have to understand where they come from and where yeah. they're going. Un- unfortunately, a lot of people that go the nursing or PA route use that as the reason. It's because they want more patient time, time with their patients. Yes. Which is sad because they probably would have made great <laughs> physicians too. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, looking at the framework of, you know, what it takes to become a physician yeah. versus a nurse versus another area in medicine I'm, I, you know, there's times when I say to myself, man, I'm not sure I would have done what I did having know what it is on the other side now, right? Mm. But, but having now been blessed to have a free clinic yeah. and the way I practice medicine, it was all worth it. Yeah. You probably could eventually have gotten there as a nurse or PA, but probably more through like network connections and mm-hmm. partnering with other, maybe another physician or someone yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we get to run our own schedule. We get to you know, have the continuity of care with our patients. And it's just been tremendous. So so essentially, everybody in my practice, 100% are uninsured. I don't take Medicaid. I don't take Medicare. Everybody has to be uninsured. Is it a hassle to do with Medicare and Medicaid? No, we just, we want to be, when, when we think of free clinic. Completely free. Completely free. Like when you walk yeah. into our, our clinic, you will pay nothing. Right. Forever. And we will continue to take you on as our patient and never let you be responsible financially for medications, procedures, labs, or imaging. Are there any clinics in the area like that? I mean, so we've had wonderful partners. For example, we work with Community Health, which is the is largest county. Or? Yep. No, no, no. It's the largest that, free clinic in the Midwest. Here, it's oh. their own. It's their own 
Um, like it's not part of the county network, no, though. No, oh, it's okay, community okay. health. It's oh. and it's a wonderful group, and you know their their funding, you know, comes from a variety of sources, which is wonderful. Okay. And I think, you know, there are very few clinics like ours that don't require some sort of small payment, and that's okay. I think when you when you talk with people about the concept of free. Mm-hmm. You know, it can really, you know, there, there, you have to be very cognizant of the patient too, right? Because there are some patients who have guilt and shame surrounding that. Mm-hmm. And you want to create an environment that helps them, you know, feel comfortable yeah. receiving care without having to pay for it. Sure, sure. And, and you know, I, I always say, because sometimes they'll just say, let me pay for something or, you know what I mean? Because they want that sort of investment and that's okay. You know what I mean? But it's always, you know, for example, we when we pay for the inhalers, it's just, you know, I write the electronic medical script. It goes to the pharmacy. We pay for it and then they send it to them. And it's a really great, it's, it's a, just such a joyous feeling. Yes. I'll tell you, like every time I step out of clinic, and, you know, follow-ups and to see patients where they were years ago to where they are now, mm. it's a really humbling and joyful experience because, um, you know, you made a direct impact into somebody's outcome. Mm. And um, that translates into them having a better quality of life, which translates to them hopefully doing better in their job or in their profession or in their family life or with their children or with whosoever. And it, and it, so it helps them to be, gives them the opportunity to be the best that they can be. Yeah. And, and sometimes like they didn't even realize it. Right. Right. Um, are you currently looking for help? I feel like you could probably employ an EMT. I, like I would or be, something. you know, and, and we've <laughs> been very blessed and I am always looking for help volunteers. Yeah. Um, we just recently um, took on a, a staff member because you know, not only is Strength to Love focused on access to health care, we are really focused on helping those families who have been affected by gun violence. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very interesting story. So my wife and I were volunteering at an after-school program many years ago. And um, one of the eight-year-old children who was in the program was tragically killed by gun violence, um, stray bullet by by gang members. And um, the child passed away and the leader of the nonprofit group came to, uh, a few volunteers and was, and asked, you know, Hey, is there any way that we could, you know, have any of you guys chip in for the burial or the funeral too? Cause these are, it's very expensive. Did you know how expensive at that I, point? No, I had, I had no yeah. idea to be yeah. honest. Um, I will say that I had some semblance of, you know, funeral and burials, outside of the city because my mother passed away Mm. uh, recently during that time. And so I was responsible for her funeral. And so I got kind of a sense, but we, my my wife and I sat together and we said, you know, I just feel like God's calling us to pay for this entire burial of this child. And so we looked at the cost. Cost was expensive, but we, we, we did. And, and that was that. And, and, you know, my wife and I said, you know, we're really grateful that we could help this family in need. So it wasn't until like a few weeks, a few months later, actually, I got a call, private number, didn't know who it was, answered it. And it was the mother of the child. She said, hey, Dr. Dave, I just want to let you know something that uh, I am so grateful that you allowed me the opportunity to go and visit my child because without your help, I would have had to cremate him. And what that allowed me to do was firstly, it got me up in the morning, got me to take a shower, got me to have purpose to go and visit him, spend some time with him. And while I always have this, you know, void in her heart that he's gone, it allowed me just to spend time with him, which got me back to work which Spend got me time with her or him? No, her her child at the cemetery. Oh. Just that personal time. What's his name? If you remember. His name was uh Janari. Janari. Yeah. And um he was a beautiful child. And mom said, you know, got back to work and got the paycheck, supporting the other family too. And I think it was that sort of lightning bolt where 
I went to my wife and I said, I think we need to do more in this realm. And I started to, honestly, you know, unfortunately here in the city, you know, we are not immune to, you know, pediatric or child gun violence. You know, on the average year, if you look year over year in the state of Illinois, uh, we're losing so many children under the age of 17 due to firearm fatalities. And I guess to take it one step further, how, what I'm noticing, it's, it's kids that are wielding these guns. Yeah. I, I mean, look, you know, death is death, right? Yeah. Um, yes, it matters who perpetrated the crimes, etc. But, you know... I guess what, what, um, what angle or perspective are you trying to tackle re- in relation to gun violence? Uh, obviously, yeah. obviously, it's the burial and funeral services, mm-hmm. but is there any other aspect to it that you're trying to... So, so, you know, sometimes people don't realize the level of pain and trauma that's associated with the loss of a child yeah. and what irreparable harms happen to not only the siblings, the family, the community. And it sometimes starts in terms of not necessarily healing, but giving them the opportunity to, again, helping somebody in a point of time in their lives that could drastically affect the arc of their life does mm-hmm. that make sense mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and that's exactly what i feel like for example in my clinic right i'm yeah. helping somebody in a great time of need who had no insurance and what i'm helping them is that in that arc of life without my interaction it could potentially lead to a different outcome for them and who they are similarly i felt the same thing about bearing children have been killed by gun violence it's 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 a you know it's one thing to lose a child firstly i can't even imagine secondly to lose a child so tragically so suddenly so violently it is a pain that is more more difficult than i could even fathom and i and i've told a number of people in the hospital, their family and loved ones that they've lost their loved one just, just right then, right? Yeah. So during our training, you know, you have these moments in the ICU and, and, and whatnot in critical situations where patients die and you're responsible to tell the family. Mm-hmm. And those are difficult conversations because the family may never really remember your name, but they'll remember your face. Mm-hmm. They'll remember that conversation, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's so... It's such a life-changing time, moment. Time stops, yeah, it's yeah. a life-changing moment. And so those conversations pale in comparison to talking with a mom or dad who lost their four-year-old tragically within a few hours to reach out to them and to say, look, Strength to Love and myself, we're here to help you through this process of you know, figuring out the arrangements so that you can have the opportunity to bury your child in a respectful manner. So what happened was, is every time I saw something tragically on the news or in the paper, you know, sometimes you'd see like a family representative or a community activist, and I would actually reach out to them and say, hey, look, um, you know, this is my foundation. We've paid for some burials before, and we we would be honored to try to help out in some way. Could you point us in the direction of the family? And most times... Oftentimes, you know, you would, you'd be able to reach, but then there's sometimes because of so much trauma that you just, you shut down. Nobody wants to be, because you don't know, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, is this somebody trying to take advantage Too of me, etc. Yeah. right? And, and full disclosure, we always work directly with the cemeteries. Mm. There was no transaction, financial transaction between the family. Like I would reach mm. out to cemeteries oh. because we felt that that was the right thing to do. That the family did not it's have just to, one less thing they have to take care exactly of. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. And so, um, what happens is that you start to know and develop relationships with community activists. Um, and one such activist is uh, is Father Mike Flager. And Father Mike is out of the Saint Sabine Church and is a you know renowned community activist in the Chicago area, but also in the country and you know, fought for civil rights with Dr. King and has just really been that beacon of hope in the Auburn Gresham community for 40 years, you know. 
And um, there was a child that we paid for, um, Michael Moultrie. Um, he was a four-year-old. was just, you know, getting ready for bed with mom. And rival gangs had some crossfire that came through the bedroom. And he was shot in the head. And he went to Loyola and he died. Mm. And um, I reached out to Mike and said, look, can we, um, you know, help out with this? And so we did. And uh, that at that point, <clears throat> this was in 2020, summer of 2021. And we're getting into now, you know, overwhelming number of children dying. Yeah. You know, we're at like... Typically, on an annual basis, you'll have 75 children under the age of 17 killed by gun violence. It's gone progressively up. This year, we're probably projected around 95. And I said to Mike, I said, this is frustrating. Um, Every single time I see a family in black and brown communities who are overwhelmingly suffering from the trauma, the loss of their child, they're going to GoFundMe pages, church kind, in-kind donations to pay for a funeral that's the average cost is $9,000. No family should have to insure their child. No family should have to depend on a GoFundMe page to bury their child. Yeah. And I said, I said, the state's, you know, it's, it, the state could be doing a better job, right? So initially, um, through the Illinois crime victims compensation act, which was, which is a, which is a appropriate reimbursement program. Mm. And reimbursement means you have to put the money like up front. Like that's been around? It's been around, okay. yeah. And it covers funeral and burial costs. But it's a reimbursement program. Yeah, who has that type of money laying exactly around? Exactly right, exactly right. And in addition, you know, there's a lot of paperwork involved. You have to go through the court of claims. You have to really, you know, spend time. And some of the families that I had, you know, helped who tried to go through this program, it took, I mean, considerable time. I'm talking years. Mm. And you also have to, you know, cooperate with the police. And there's a lot of different things, too, that that required participation in this program. And so I went to Father Mike and I said, look, I have an idea. I, 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 I do believe that I can create policy or law that could help facilitate payments quickly, clearly, and especially, you know, to take the burden off the family. And I think quickly is a really key thing here because you really have only a few days to arrange the funeral and the burial after you get notified by the medical examiner and go and, you know, identify the body. And, you know, these arrangements are really fast. Mm. And if you don't, you know, get the money together, you know, you're forced to take a cheaper route. Yeah, okay. So I said, look, I have an idea that if we simply put together verification which is a de- which is a uh, certification of death right from the medical examiner which can be classified by you know homicide by firearm then you provide income verification right that you are in financial need mm. why can't we get the money to the families earlier you think it was coming from the same budget as that act well so I'll, uh so I, this is in um uh you know winter of 2021 now we are okay mm-hmm. And I said to him, I said, Father Mike, do you know anybody that could help me in the legislature? And he said, actually, Senator Jackie Collins is a parishioner in my church, and I think she'd be very interested in this. I can open the door for you, but you need to do the rest. I said, have have at it. So he introduced me. We had some meetings, and I went through my framework of my law. Mm. And she said, Dave, I can't tell you how necessary this is. And she became my champion in the Senate, uh, Rep. Lilly, Camille Lilly, became my champion in the House. And we literally, I wrote the bill, and I named it after Michael, mm. Michael Moultrie Act. And the governor signed it within a few months, and he signed it in 2022, in May 10th on my birthday in Peoria. Mm. And it went into effect a few weeks ago. And now, any family whose child is under the age of 17 dies by gun violence can go to any cemetery and any funeral home in the state of Illinois and get $10,000 within three days. It's amazing. I, it's firstly... I guess... I, yeah, go ahead first. Well, it's terrible that we have to have a law like this. I mean, you know, it's very... It, it is a... Yeah. It's a travesty, to think, be honest. I think most people are, are 
thinking about the prophylactic or the preventative side. Uh, and to be honest, maybe not thinking as much uh, because most of us are not or don't have victims of gun violence. So it's, it's, it's rare to think about things like burial services and funeral services and costs. Uh, so h- how did you arrive at that, at that solution of like how to make it accessible and quick and straight to the point where they yeah. don't have to deal with anything? Again, you know, that's what I try to look at issues and problems from a perspective of, okay, let's put forth a solution, do it in a small manner, analyze it, figure out what works, what doesn't work. Let's scale up, use the data, and go back and do it again and again until we can massively scale it. Similarly for my clinic, right? We started with one patient. So before the before the bill, you were helping people with those with their own services that's exactly right yeah Uh, i mean i was i was paying directly to cemeteries for how can we scale this yes because the the common theme was this black and brown families don't have enough to pay for and nobody really has any money to pay for nine thousand dollars of 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 capital Mm -hmm. in a short period of time Mm -hmm. while they're experiencing the worst loss and trauma of their lives and how much added pressure that puts on you and pain and suffering. I can't tell you how many people, because I still keep in contact with these families, you know, that were forced to cremate their child because they didn't have money to pay for their burial. And what happens is that that parent comes home to that urn sitting on the bedside and it's a constant reminder that they didn't have the funds to do that. Mm-hmm. And that trauma continues and perpetuates, and that pain continues, rather than, again, a a mother saying, I got up in the morning with purpose, I took a shower, my goal was to go and see my son at the cemetery and spend time with him, to mourn him, to talk to him, to pray. And that allowed me to get back to work to earn that paycheck, to put food on the table. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see 10, 20 years on the line yeah. the ripple, ripple effects uh, this is going to have. And what's wonderful about this law is that there is no sunset. Mm. And no, what, oh, so there's no like... There's no sunset on this law. The Michael Moultrie Act, and, and I'll be honest, that was an important aspect that I wrote in the bill. Because quite frankly, you know, we we have a grasp, unfortunately, of how many people would participate in this program or are eligible to participate, right? We have the data. We know that this year we'll have about 95 children under the age of 17 who will be killed by a firearm in the state. It's unfortunate, but you can predict these things based on previous year data. Secondly, based on previous years of participation, you can tell the percent of those, you know, who could qualify, mm. you know, for this program and who, and, and the biggest thing, and, and, let me just say this. It does you no good to pass legislation like this if nobody knows about it. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and so with our bill going into effect a few weeks ago, we really have tried to, and, and we are continuing to step this up in terms of helping people understand that it's there, walking families through the paperwork. And, and I might add that the paperwork I wrote that the DHS is using. I wrote it. Nice. And so we're very familiar with it, clearly, and we can help those people um, and families who've lost their children so that they can get the money they need very quickly, you know? Can you imagine seeing Strength to Love on, like, the CTA, like, posters (laughs) on the CTA? (laughs) I I will say this. Um, You know, way leads to way. We feel that going back to that good neighbor philosophy right like everybody is experiencing some sort of difficult experience it doesn't matter who you are and we really do need to you know cultivate a renewal of this good neighbor mentality Mm -hmm. that a lot of times when we look at somebody in need uh, we're very quick to ask ourselves the question what will happen to myself if i help them yeah, yeah, inherent self-interest. Mm-hmm. But but really what we should be doing is reversing the question. What would happen to this individual if I do not help them? Mm. And I think that can change the framework of when we approach people in need. Mm. I really do. Mm. 
Because what will then at least make you ponder that yeah. you are that person in that time, in that very moment, that can really change this person's life. And and it may not be something, you know, Drastic, earth moving, profound, right? Yeah. yeah. But what we what you can't comprehend, and I can't either, is that maybe you have altered the arc of their life in some way, in a better way. Yeah. Are you coming from the perspective of like, you're just a vessel to bless other people? Or are you coming from like the, is, do you acknowledge the egoic like aspect of it, of like the feel good vibes of like, I get to help people? Yeah. Uh, Look, at the end of the day, I find no greater joy than to have a non-transactional behavior that provides help and assistance to somebody. It's awesome. Mm. There's no expectation of a thank you or anything in return, Mm. honestly. And I've come from that viewpoint for a long time, especially being in the medical field, Mm -hmm. right? Like, it's our jobs to care for people. Yeah, We don't look for thank yous or anything like that. It's our job to heal them. That's it. I think that we've I've translated that into other areas of, of the world now. And I'm just looking for I'm looking for people and groups and communities to help through the lens of pain. And what mm-hmm. I found is that after getting into access to healthcare, getting into helping people with gun violence and the effects of gun violence, that there's just so much pain. I mean, it's universal. And then it got me thinking that maybe that is the construct of life, right? Well, I mean, yeah, in Buddhism, I mean, a lot, it, yeah. we're just prone to pain and suffering. And yeah. and maybe a lot of that is is through your own thoughts. But there are so many external factors that just add to the level, level of suffering that we're all experiencing. And, and that's exactly what's been happening over the last couple of decades, right? Yeah. Is that the boot of injustice is pressing down so hard mm. on so many groups of people's throats. Mm. And it will not let off unless we have leaders who really take a stand on that type of injustice, right? Yeah. From people not accessing healthcare, who can't bury their children when they're dead, who are hungry, who don't have shelter, who don't have clothing. These are facets of life that should be provided or rights for human beings, right? Because that is necessary to live a meaningful life. Yeah. You know? And you're no longer worried about the basic necessities. Exactly right. Because then you get to try to put forth that creativity, that ingenuity, Mm -hmm. that intelligence, that drive, the resilience to be the best of who you are. Mm -hmm. And it's really, I mean, look, and I think we're talking about the interdependence of life here, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That I cannot be the best that I can be. We're interconnected. We are. I mean, look, I cannot be the best that I can be unless you ought to be the best that you ought to be. Hmm. Right? Yeah. Help me help you. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but again, you cannot be yeah. the best that you cannot be unless I am. So yeah. I think we're talking about this interdependence of life where, you know, King so eloquently says that, you know, for us to get to this podcast, right, we depended on so many different things, whether it's our car that was made in Detroit or the food that was made at, you know, uh, the restaurant or, you know, the grocery store and the guy that, you know, got, you know, grew it, that transported it there. And, you know, we, we, we failed to understand how interdependent we are on it, it so many brings things. brings a sense of gratitude. Right? Yeah. And if you don't have that realization that we are dependent on each other, it makes it hard to really altruistically help your community. Yeah. It becomes hard. Yeah. To, uh, to be, uh, the, I guess, rebuttal to that. Um, I've heard the perspective of like everyone around you can be a liability. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and to just, to be, responsible for your own actions and and to not depend on others and everything that 
happens from the people around you is just a bonus on top. To not expect anything from anyone else so you're never let down. I'm, I think that's a way that you can absolutely approach life. What I do think... I wonder if you can believe both, though. Exactly right. Right, right. to have that framework in mind. Because for me, you know, the purpose of our lives can be can vary from, from people to people. I will say that... I do fundamentally believe that relationships are a key aspect of living and that we grow as people and we learn about ourselves, even though there is risks, right? Mm -hmm. With connecting with people and relationships, right? Uh, The risk of hurt, the risk of failure, you Mm -hmm. know, the risk of pain. Yeah. But when you look at the sum of it, that that risk, the benefits outweigh it, right? of connecting with our fellow human beings because that grows into a community and that community grows into something bigger. And I, I look at the end of the day, Victor, I'm like a speck of sand on an infinite beach. And you can say, look, Dave, you're not moving the needle in any direction of what you're doing. And you, you actually are right. I completely agree. But so, so, so the, the question is like, why are you doing all this stuff? And I'll tell you why. So there's a scripture, Matthew 25, uh, and the concept revolves around what I actually believe existentially. Like for me, you know, I've seen a lot of people take their last breath, like mm-hmm. on this earth, literally. You're in the room and they die. Mm-hmm. And it's a very... Um, and you've had conversations with people in the medical field too as well who have been in similar positions. It's a very interesting time. And many times you think about, man, what happens next? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I ask myself a lot that too. What I believe personally is that I'm going to have to ask, answer a few questions, mm-hmm. right? Uh, when, when, when that happens to me. And I, I can list them to you. One, hey, Dave, you know, when people were sick, did you heal them? Try to heal them. When they were hungry, did you try to feed them? When they were naked, did you try to clothe them? When they were in prison, did you think of them? Did you try to visit them? And I want to answer yes. So a lot of this has to do with personal accountability. Mm. That that's something that I really strive for is that I want to answer yes. Based on a belief that there's an afterlife yeah absolutely what if you don't okay so do you and now we're getting philosophical but like do you need to believe this to end up in the afterlife what if you don't just don't believe you there's no afterlife for you exactly right and i think i completely respect other people's belief systems i i'm just really sharing what i believe yeah you know what i mean we all tell ourselves certain things to help us live through this life yeah yeah i i just or at least make sense of it I, you know, because there are a lot of, whether it's agnostic or atheist or, you know, different other, um, you know, religions, I deeply respect anything that anybody believes or doesn't believe. But what I can share is what I believe and what drives me to do what I've been doing mm-hmm. and hopefully God willing will do. And it really is centered around this concept of being a good neighbor, looking at pain through the lens of communities but all the way on the individual level and how do we reduce pain even on a temporary level to affect the arc of a human being yeah that's it i go to uh, literally from you know 4 a.m when i'm up till 11 p.m when i sleep that's really what i'm focused about and people will say man you're too intense with this Mm. but if you really look at it time is our most precious asset Mm -hmm. you blink of an eye and you're it's gone and and that's just from a natural cause yeah, of death. I mean, exactly you, we could just right. get hit by a bus or yep. whatever, stray bullet. You yeah. Know? And if you don't take advantage of the life that you have, the one life that you have, then what is the purpose, mm-hmm. right? And then what I mean by advantage is that for me is to try to help as many people as I can before I take my last breath. And people do it in different ways. And trust right. me, whether it's through art, whether it's through creation, whether it's through science, you know, all these different vocations. I think it's yeah. wonderful. For me, 
I'm trying to figure out how do I reduce people's pain, typically on a temporary basis, in order for them to impact the arc of their lives at that moment so that they can at least somewhat become the best of who they are. Yeah. Speaking of uh, of pain, have you met providers that like come from the pers- maybe they were burnt out, but like just pain can be subjective. Um, someone can outwardly display that they're in a, a, a in a sense of pain, but uh, if you've seen this person maybe five times out of five days out of the seven days, it's like, are you really in pain? Or so. I guess. Do you even have that thought, or just like all pain is pain to you, and and you will do everything in your power to alleviate that you know it's interesting you brought that question up because one of the things i do encounter is essentially a systemic desensitization of pain Mm. you're around pain so much right you're experiencing pain that you just try to stop thinking about it or you ignore it yeah Like, like i'll give you a good example right let's just talk about the general you know, acceptance of our murder, child murder rate here in the city. Yeah, how, how, yeah. How can how, one, how laissez-faire it exactly is. right. Yeah. How can one really be exactly right, laissez-faire yeah. or just nonchalant about it? You know, any child who's murdered, anybody who's murdered in general is one too many. But when you take away a life of a child who is the future of our world, I mean, and to think and in, in, in a general framework, right? When you see the passing news stories and then that's it and you go along your day. Is the, that normal? The world keeps going. Yeah. The, the Ukrainian war. Right. We're, not, none of us stops. Right. We just keep, we, ha- yeah. we have the ability to podcast right now. Mm-hmm. It's insane to me sometimes when you think about it. And I guess to move forward, you have to kind of stop thinking about it. And I think it's helpful to revisit that thought to like really ground you and be like, it's, um, we're very, how fortunate uh, you are and how unfortunate others can be. I do think that if we look at the direction of where we're going, there are multiple, you know, the pain is not going to stop as you insinuated, but it's only going to get worse. If we don't have people who step up and to say, Enough is enough. Mm-hmm. We have to do our part to limit it in order for us to have a meaningful life, right? A better life. Like, yes, you can have a meaningful life filled with just constant pain, yeah. but wouldn't it be better if you had less? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I think everybody can, you know, yeah. agree on that, right? Nobody's arguing to me, Dave, what you're doing is, is, yeah. is ludicrous. But I don't think many people are thinking about the how. Right. Yeah. And you have to be creative because yeah. clearly the how is not working. Mm. Right? So so I'll give you a good example. I really found in my patient population that are suffering from, you know, diet related diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension. And they live in areas where they just don't have access to fresh food. Mm. And good segue. And and it's and it's very true. I call them food apartheids. Okay. And people call them food deserts. I call them food apartheids. And what's the difference? I mean, you have essentially, you know, generational systemic racism and issues that have, you know. Oh, so there's a, the race component. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like I mean, red, redlining. I'm, I'm trying to get a few people yes. on for that. For but, sure. Yeah. That, and, and, you know, if you look at the geographic locations, they're predominantly centered in black and brown communities. Yeah. And... What that does is it lends, it's not lends, it's directly related to the outcomes of large groups of people who cannot be the best of who they are because they do not have access to fresh food. Mm. They don't. And so, you know, and, and, and I knew that through my medical training, right, on how we treated and Maybe on a superficial level. Exactly, right. Yeah. But you just didn't understand that until you get to this small level of understanding your patient on a consistent basis of where they come from. And you ask them like, what are you eating? And you know, they'll rattle off a ton of, you know, processed foods, carbonated sugary drinks. And then you ask them, you're like, well, you know, 
can't you, you know, what about trying some, you know, fresh, nutritious food? They're like, Doc, I can't get to anything. I got to take two buses and then a transfer and then walk with my cart in order to get to a grocery store that has, you know, moldy produce that mm-hmm. costs more than what you'd get that would be costing me to go to McDonald's. And then you're like, you're right. Mm-hmm. Like, why would I take two brushes, transfer, walk with my cart, and go to get food that was spoiled and yeah. pay more for it? Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? And then what happens is that generationally, you know, some of this is genetically transmitted too. Obesity, we know, is genetic. There's a genetic component, mm. right? And and then they're in that same neighborhood, right? Yeah. The children. And so you see what I'm saying? It's like, and then on top of that, so, so... I said to myself, all right, you know, what can we do, right? What can I do to get people food? So I, t- I tinkered around with, you know, looking at the data and, and what programs have been working, you know, with firstly looking at grocery stores. That's hard. Uh, we've seen, you know, the difficulties in our communities, right? Whole Foods, Walmart, uh, you know, these is other it, corporations. When they had to close, is it because they weren't making money? Is it just a money thing? Or? Yeah, I mean, so if you look at the tax um, incremental financing, the TIF portion of tax breaks, if you come in those areas, um, you know, they were given a 10-year TIF, and those TIFs, which are tax breaks, to being in those areas expired. Wow, it's been 10 years? I remember when they moved yeah, in. Yeah, oh my God. that's exactly right. Oh, wow. So if you look at the, uh, and look, we can always see what is really, but but that's a How fact. How can they put a limit on that? In, in the sense of like, if if it it takes more, obviously going to take more than ten years for this is a generational systemic issue, you know. And wow, that's insane. And and look, uh, owning a grocery store is very hard. Yeah. Margins are very small. The profit margin is one to two percent, and it's a lot of work. I understand, but. That's the cost of, you know, healing people, right? Are Do, are there neighborhood bodegas that are kind of subs like that? Oh, absolutely. They're the lifeblood the of these communities. Urban gardens, uh, mm-hmm. pop up shops, mm-hmm. this and that. I mean, yes, absolutely. These are the lifeblood of food sources. But but the problem is, is that you know, one, these are not sometimes stable sources, right? Yeah. Bodegas come in close. Look at what's happening on the commercial side. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. paying rent right now is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they're affected by yield production too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You you, you come there and let's say you bring, I I don't know, mangoes, right? And you're the bodega and or or other fresh produce, right? Eggs. We saw the the price, you know, exponential rise in egg prices just not too long ago, right? Mm -hmm. How can one, as a business owner who has a bodega, purchase that and then get that out to the public while not charging more? And, you know, in these communities, you just, for that period of time, not buy eggs. Do you see what I'm saying? It's, yeah. it's, a, very, yeah. it's a very supply side, you know, process. But, but, but going back to, you know, my, my moniker is food is medicine yeah. as a physician, right? Food is medicine. And Very we have to, of you. We have, well, we have to have that mentality if we're really going to look at it from a perspective of how important fresh quality food is to our bodies and, and what it can really change in not only from a physiologic perspective, but also from a societal perspective, from a social perspective, from you name it, everything gets better when you have access to fresh food. Man, yeah. And, and so, you know, from me thinking about Maybe putting a grocery store in a school that didn't really get traction here in the city. That was a, you tried doing that. Well, you know, we toy, we tinkered with in it. a high school or, or elementary school or? in a in an upper level school, and okay. it, it was not the easiest thing to do. And I said to my wife, I said, you know, there's a lot of hurdles because I'm telling you, it's the access to the food. If we get people the food. I think this is going to be a spark that lights a huge fire. And she said, well, what do you have in mind? And I said, well, I think we should be farmers. I think we should get a farm. She said, well, you're crazy. And, you know, my parents were immigrants from India. We settled. And I was born in Peoria, Illinois. And I was raised in Bloomington. How many 
Indians are in Peoria? Is that a, is that so a big, is we, that a big uh, Indian population? No, no. So when we settled there in the early, eight, so late 70s, my mom and dad came there. I was born in 1980 in wow. Peoria, Illinois. And when I was in, you know, preschool and early school, I was really the only South Asian in, sure. in, in the community. You know what I mean? There were a few, but, and we can talk about like, you know, prejudice and things like that that we grew up but but the fact is is that you know in central illinois you're just around fields and, yeah, and you my said min- a lot of your friends were, were oh, children of absolutely farmers. absolutely yeah. like you know i would go and spend nights on my buddy's farms mm. as their parents were farmers really more just you know what we do in illinois soy and corn mm. that's it and um so you're around it and it's almost like you know absorbing it through osmosis <laughs> do you know what i mean <laughs> You know about, you know, wind whipping, dust up, and mm. just being on flat land. But that never left me, you know. And um, going back to my wife, I said, I just think, I, r- I really do feel that we need to do more for our state in providing food as medicine. Mm. And to do that, we need to create a, a hunger initiative where we can actually grow the food, pick the food, logistically get it to people through the mechanisms that can get it out into the community and what better way to do that through the food banks and the food pantries so this is this is wild oh, so straight to the source exactly right and you don't you don't have any sort of you know regulatory logistic hurdles if i grow my food and i give it away <laughs> nobody ain't gonna stop me i mean that's a fact and so i'll tell you what so so when you buy farmland you cannot go to a realtor you don't just like you know go to redfin and be like eh, i think i'm gonna yeah. get a farm What's it doesn't, that work. Process it like? doesn't work like that so <laughs> you gotta actually find so so the majority of land now farmland are sold at auction wow and, well, and is there a reason for that or? yeah there is a reason for that because well firstly farmland is limited in our country mm-hmm. so if you cap something on a, a supply side limit you can understand what it does to the demand sure number two um you're seeing uh quite a bit of corporate absorption surprise of it hasn't rate. happened like at a higher rate right exactly yeah. right and and so what what the consequence of that is you're seeing just a destruction of family farms which is terrible yeah. and so we th- this is a really interesting story so in 2021 um I had this idea and I started just doing some searches of how do you like literally Googling, like how do you buy farmland? (laughs) And what happened was, is that there wasn't, so I deduced within a short period of time that you got to get through auction or private sale. Mm. And I don't know any farmers that Mm. could just call up and be like, Hey, can I buy your farm? Uh, And so, you know, I did, I, I knew research, right? So everything around growing anything involves the dirt Mm -hmm. you gotta have good dirt Mm. and we can talk about like soil positivity index nutrients elements etc but the fact is and you knew did you know that after or before before i knew knew all that before yes Yes. because i wasn't just gonna spend capital without knowing what i'm spending it on (laughs) okay right because if i knew so so what you do is you have to do your due diligence you got to go back look at yield production Look at soil positivity index. How is it uh, during constraints of drought and overwatering? Sure, you know what I mean? Because sure. you, you want to buy, if you're going to invest money, you want to produce, you wanna produce yeah. in, in very hard times and, and yeah. in good times. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right. So it was very interesting because being from central Illinois, I'm going to tell you something. Central Illinois has one of the best dirt mm. in the world. Mm. In the world. Outside of like New Zealand, which has volcanic soil, which is just so wonderful for elements and what they yeah. grow in New Zealand's Hawaii phenomenal. Hawaii and New Zealand, yeah, yeah, exactly right. But Central Illinois has just such wonderful That's dirt. And um, do do people generally shit on Peoria? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, so I was born in Peoria, but we moved to Bloomington when I was okay. about five or six. Okay. So, but McLean County, Tazewell County, Peoria County is all home for me. And uh, yes, they do. Uh, yeah, one of our instructors is uh, in the med school at Peoria. Yeah. And uh, I'll tell you that. Good dirt. <laughs> Good dirt. And so, long story short, I found that there was an auction for a family who was giving up their farmland as the, you know, third, fourth, and fifth generation now steadily moved away. 
and wanted to sell the land. And they were actually having a large auction three days after I had this idea. And it was on a Tuesday. Wow. It was on a Tuesday. Monday was Labor Day. And I was, we went down on Sunday to go see the farm. My wife's like, look, if we're going to buy a farm, I'm going to go meet the farmer. I'm going to go see what the land has done, what's it look like, what it's grown. And um, we went down there, and I already had this idea that the farm, obviously we want to create a successful business with the farm and what it does in terms of commercial corn and soybeans, but I knew I was going to carve out a large portion of the farm for food that we would grow and give away. Mm -hmm. So I go down there, and it's in Gardner, Illinois. Gardner is a town of, you know, 500 people. It's a wonderful town. Very small. Our restaurant is called Restaurant. <laughs> and um, we went and visited our, 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 the farm, and we met the tenants and everything. And so I said to him, I said, hey, uh, you've had some people come and visit, I'm sure, to check out the farm. He said, yeah, there's just been a lot of s corporate suits. Ooh. You know? Yeah. And I'm, that yeah. sort of sunk my heart. I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to, if I go to this auction, I can't which I... no corporation. And I've never been to an auction, ever. Oh. So I'm like, great. Not only am I going to go to an auction for the first time, bid on something that will be bidded up by a corporation who's got billions of dollars. Sure. And I, I went to the... Because it was, it was key for me to have somebody have buy-in, right? Because if this farmer who has been a t tenant on this farm for generations wasn't going to buy into what I wanted to do. It's going to be hard for me to not only purchase farm, but then I got to find a farmer to help me with the land. Cause I, I guess while I, mm. while I do know some things about farming, I don't know how to drive a combine. I don't know how to physically plant, you know, rows of corn. Mm. So you need to have buy-in. So I went to the tenant and he's a wonderful man. A very, very just humble man. And I said, hey, um, I got this idea if we end up winning this auction. He goes, let me hear it. I said, I want to carve out a portion of the farm to first grow sweet corn. And he goes, okay. He goes, sweet corn. I mean, we could do like, you know, a quarter of an acre. We get a lot and we just give it away and just sort of grill it. And I said, nah, I kind of want to do more than that. He's like, well, what are you thinking? I said, well... I, I think I want to do like 16 acres. And he he looked at me and I said, and he goes, well, are we going to sell it? And I said, no, I'd like to give it away to people who are hungry. He just, he started laughing, a booming. He's like, ah, oh, 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 that was a great joke, Dave. And I'm like, I wasn't laughing. I go, I'm, I'm being serious. And so he kind of just said, okay. He just looked at me like I was, you know, uh, the over minor your, the minority head, yeah. like you know who's this guy you know was there any part of you trying to convince him for a private sale or is that even not possible at this point he, at that point so he didn't own the farm it was a tenant he's he was a tenant. a tenant the third fourth generation tenant there and I'll, I'll tell you the land once was owned by abraham lincoln and from what the family oh. told me was that um before he went to congress he gave uh, this portion to the patriarch and that patriarch held it in the family until uh, until it went up for auction. Wow. So I go to the auction uh, after Labor Day. We were fortunate to get, you know, the financing approval that we needed to, to so we had a max cap, you know, of what we could spend. So it gets from, up to... From who? From our financing. Uh, uh, agricultural financing. Oh, yes. Okay. There are... So exactly right. So I'm going to be honest. I was rejected so many times by other banks to say, you want to do what? You want to buy farmland? Like, you don't know anything about farmland. Even if I had a business plan to submit to them, uh, commercial, you know, lending firms were like, you're insane. I'm not doing this. Because they want their money back. That's it. Well, and on top of that, you know, they look at me as a liability, mm -hmm. a risk. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many people turned me down during that, you know, few days. I was on the phone literally eight hours a day for right. other lending institutions, right. giving them my, you know, credit checks and supplying our, you know, uh, you know, personal finances and returns and everything. Turned down, turned down, turned wow. down. And it wasn't until I talked to a specific, uh, and I'll, I'll, I can name them, right? It's fine. It's, com com it's, it's, it's Compure Financial. They're a wonderful, wonderful wonderful company 
And their goal is to help young farmers who want to start on their own. How'd you find them? I, I, they, I honestly, it came up in a conversation from another lending institution who turned me down, oh. who said, you know what, Dave, let me, let me, let me tell you about Compeer. It was another like institution was like, we ain't going to give you the money, but let me tell you about Compeer. And they gave me a number and I called the the office. It's in a rural town in Illinois. And I was oh. like, Hey, uh, this is Dr. Dave here. And, uh, I am a physician and I'd like to get pre-approved to buy some farmland. And they're, and instantly they're like, and so they're like, all right, send us your tax returns, et cetera. And then they call me back and they're like, all right, yeah, we're good. And I'm like, I'm like, what? It was that easy. It was that, and, and like, I was, and I was like, I was like, no, 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 no. Like, did you go through it? Did you miss anything here? And they're like, no, 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 you're good. So we pre-approved you to get this amount for your land, go to the auction. And, and this is routine for them because all land is typically sold at auction or private sale. Yeah. You know what I mean? For farmland. So I got, I was armed with a letter, you know, the pre-approval letter and I went to the auction. I was the only minority in the room and everybody was wearing no masks and I was the only one with a mask, just a surgical mask. And, you know, people yeah. that were in there, uh, you know, small towns, everybody comes to just see what's going on. And then you had, a uh, the, the auction was also online, like over the phone too, for people to call in. Oh. And I don't, have you seen like you know, what auctions are like in the movies. You know what I mean? It looks a little hostile. Oh my gosh. And you have people talking, the, the, the auctioneer is talking like, that fast? I mean, really fast. Like, it's, you know, the old micro machine commercials, you mm. know, the guy, I mean, like I'm talking really, it's hard to understand him. And then they also have what's called runners. So the runners sort of help if you're involved in bidding, will come to you and sort of tell you what the auctioneer is at, who your competition is. And so you have to understand when you're bidding on farmlands, they're they're sectioned off in parcels. Mm. Each parcel has a certain number of acres, and then you go through, you know, the price per acre. Mm. So every like let's say a, a parcel's a thousand acres, wow. and then they're telling you a, the price of one acre. Let's say just for you know ex- explanation purposes is like a thousand dollars, and then the price goes up to. Eleven hundred dollars. You have to extrapolate how much more you're paying, yeah. and you're doing this on the fly. Wow! And that was your first time. So, but but I came with these like tables because I had in my mind because you know what I did? I just YouTube auctions, instead right? Of crunching the numbers, right? You I, had, I, I oh, like I so had oh. well, I YouTubed. You can find anything there, and I YouTubed yeah. farm <laughs> auctions, and then these sort of videos came up, and I was like, okay, I better have my numbers ready to go, so I know in real time, you know what my max is. So we're the, the, the parcels for the farm that we were interested in comes up. And, you know, there were three bidders, including myself. And the price kept going up and up. And, um, you know, it was getting kind of, it was really intense. And I knew what my max side was. And the competition was there. And I had a sense that... A lot of this auction was theatrics, right? Like to f- inflate the numbers. Not or? only to inflate the numbers, but to like. So, for example, like you know, let's say the counter bid, you know, holds up their paddle quickly, you know, to show strength, and then like you on the other side can just you know wait put your you wait it out and put your hand in your in your head. And <laughs> they almost like, got me. Yeah, exactly. I'm out. Right. <laughs> exact, exactly right. And so, I actually did this. This is funny. So. Um, I, I like, you know how you call a timeout in sports? I was like this to the runner and I could sense that the guy was really on his max and we weren't there yet for our budget. So I went out and I called up my wife who was really anxious cause she didn't come with me. She stayed with wow. the kids and she's like, so I call her up and she's like, what happened? What happened? And I'm like, well, I took a timeout. She's like, what do you mean you took a timeout? I was like, well, I'm in the middle of bidding on the land. She goes, what do you mean you took a timeout? And I was like, well, it's theatrics. I want him to think that I'm coming to you to ask, because I actually said, timeout, can I call my wife? That's what I said. Mm, for more money. Yes, selling. that's exactly uh, right. Uh. And so I said, Alicia's my wife's name. I said, Alicia, we're going to get this. I said, I'm very confident he's at his end. We're going to push him over it and we'll win. And so I stayed out there and the runner came out. He's like, hey, you all right? 
I was like, yeah. And so I went in and we did a couple more back and forths with some, you know, theatrical pauses, hand in the head. And then I just went over the top. Wow. And the auction came to us. And I want to tell you something. The first thing I did, the family who had been farming the land, you know, the tenants had yeah. been there for years, the sons, the daughters, everybody was in the room. And I had told him, I said, look, if we win, I want to keep your family on. So historically, not with that family, but like most families get told to move out then? Yes, you oh. can. And most most people now, and especially corporate uh, corporations who buy farmland, they bring in corporate farmers. Oh, my God. That's it. it literally, the 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 path. The path of the family farm is on a really disastrous course. So this was a really special moment because after we won, and I went to the family and we were all there and we shared this wonderful moment because, I, you know, for me, a lot of times it's just a handshake and a look in the eye and mm. that's it. The deal's done with me. That's sort of how I work. So you know, lawyers and everything can work things out, but generally I shake a hand, I look in the eye and say, we have a deal, we have a deal. And so I looked him in the eye and I said, I'm so excited to keep you on. And we shared a hug and a few tears. And because, you know, our farm was, you know, a significant portion of their income. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so we shared that moment. And I said, now don't forget, you know, because this is Labor Day after, you know, the sweet corn seasons are. I was like, don't forget what we're doing next season. He's like, all right, Dave. <laughs> and, you know, that was that. So we incorporated Nyack Farms 2021. Uh, you know, got the website and logo and everything, but really over the winter, it was planning yeah. to figure out, all right, how am I going to now grow food? So we knew we need to work with the food banks. Okay. And how do we do that? Well, there are eight major food banks in Illinois. Oh wow! Each of them fall under the Feeding Illinois umbrella, which is a subsidiary of Feeding America. Are you familiar with Feeding America? They are a government entity that is responsible for feeding the hungry. Okay. And Feeding America is a wonderful program that you know, operates under the purview of the USDA in terms of funding. Okay. And they utilize that funding to procure and operate large food banks. So there are food banks and food pantries. This is how I describe them. Okay. Food banks are logistical operation. Okay, that's okay. all they are. So they buy food. They look at what pantries, which are these smaller areas where the community goes to, to see their needs. Mm. Food banks recognize the needs of the pantry, so they purchase the food from the money of the USDA, get the food collated in these large food banks, and then they deliver it out to the pantries. The pantries deliver it out to the communities. Okay. That's how, That's cool. that is how our food systems work in food insecure places. So I said to myself, what better way to get the food to the people than directly to the banks? Okay. So I, I, I learned that the major food banks in Illinois operate under Feeding Illinois. So I said, well, let me call the president of the Feeding Illinois. Wow. And so I got in contact. His name is Steve Erickson. And Steve and I are now, uh, we're, good, we're great friends. Hmm. And I said to Steve, I said, hey, so I got this farm. He's like, okay. I said, I'd like to grow some food and deliver it to you. And he looked at me like, well, what are you talking about? I was like, because I was like, well, where do you get your other, like, sweet corn? And I, and, I, and I have, this is a method to my madness. I started with sweet corn because while sweet corn is not the most nutritious specialty produce, right? So specialty produce means everything that's not, um, you know, beef, pork, mm. um, corn, soy. It's really more like produce, veggies and fruits. Mm. And I said to him, hey, Steve, uh, you know, where do you get? some of this in terms of from the farmers he said well we have to buy it or they just donate small amounts sure. you know what i mean so so i said well the sweet corn it's it's wonderful for our state because if you're in let's say inglewood in, in a black community you know sweet corn is grilled if you're in the hispanic community let's say east st louis mm. it's made into you know quesadilla or like you know some sort of um you know soup and if you're in the rural area and typically it's just eaten. You mm. throw it in a, I boil it, throw some butter on it. And it so, but what is universally recognized is that sweet corn tastes good mm -hmm. and people like it. Mm. And it's got some nutritional value. So I said, look, if I start with lima beans, this program's not going to last too long. <laughs> and so we started with sweet corn and I said, hey, Steve, I'd like to donate and well, I grow, pick, deliver you sweet corn. 
what's what is like one of the larger donors of sweet corn? He said, well, about an acre to two acres. I was like, let's do 16 and see what happens. And he looked at me like, you are just like the farmer did, just like everybody else in my life yeah. typically does and says, you're nuts. I guess, why hasn't it been thought of or done before? Or what are the margins like for Too farmers? expensive. Too expensive. Margins are... Are you too- losing money on this? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh. <laughs> but we supplant it, you know, with... Well, firstly, under the non-profit, like, on, is it? Is no, it, no, no, no. It's, it's for profit. It's for profit, but it's not in the profit yet. It's going to take years to actually sustain itself, based on what we're selling from the commercial side. And but also, you look at look, land values have gone up. Mm. See what I mean? So, so, but, but, is that that is a goal? Obviously, of any business is to be profitable, yeah. right? But how much profits do you need? Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Like. I don't need excessive profits in order to fulfill the mission of feeding people. That's where my profit is, right? Right. And I think that's something that I think people misinterpret. I guess have you put have you put a number as to like how long like we're projecting when it will turn a profit? 6 years, 7 years. Okay. And I think what what will happen is that and I and other entities now are coming to buy our specialty, our corn and now our green beans or sweet corn and green beans because cool. they believe in our mission and, yeah. and, and to understand to say, look, if you buy just a small part of it, you're helping us do this. Exactly. Right. And again, we're not, and, and some of the things, you know, what we're going to sell next, we've already commitments for next season. Mm. And, you know, while it's not at a wholesale level, but it's just a little higher than that. I mean, it's definitely a reduced cost that you would pay at a large grocery store, et cetera. And, but what it's helping us do is to grow our program. So last year we fed about a hundred and a little over a hundred thousand people in our state. We grew 16 acres. I bought, so instead of, you know, building a nice home on our farmhouse and, you know, developing the land, I bought machinery and semi-trucks. Mm. And because we and pallets and uh, you know cages to keep the corn in and you know all these wow. things that would help us to because the the rate limiting step here is not the fact that farmers are not there. I mean they are they are literally the most generous people. It's the, on the other planet. logistics exactly right. It oh. costs a lot to not only so so traditionally sweet corn is picked by hand. Mm. I bought a single row corn uh, sweet corn picker. That's, that's not cheap. Is that but, automated or is that? Yes. A, oh. We pull it on our tractor. It goes down the row. Oh. It harvests the, the ears of corn. We follow it with a forklift and the bin, and it deposits in there. Once it fills up, we turn around the forklift, load it in the back of the truck, grab another bin, and go. Wow. So we can do, you know, today, uh, like, it's interesting. I delivered 22,000 pounds of sweet corn throughout the city of Chicago. And one of the members of my team who was up here in the city has never seen something as much as corn on our semi trucks. And actually, this was a smaller load. She and she asked, "Hey, how long did this take to harvest?" Because there was literally twelve. You know, there there was a lot of you know large bins. And I said, honestly, like six hours. But if you had to do it by hand, mm. it would take you a full couple weeks. Mm. So so that's really in terms of logistics, right? And that costs front end capital that we needed to spend mm. on the single row corn picker. And I would shout out to my partners at Oxbow International who builds the machinery and they were wonderful to provide us that. And and you want to know something why this was meant that we planted our sweet corn last, you know, in around April. And uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, we did not, they delivered the sweet corn 24 hours before our corn was going to go and we got it up and running and we were harvesting everything. So if you waited any longer, it would have spoiled. Yes, absolutely. So last year we fed a hundred thousand people. We delivered our sweet corn to the, you know, major food banks. And it was a really successful time where, whereby, uh, the Biden administration contacted us and said, look, we're rolling out our hunger initiative. We want to end hunger by 2030. What you're doing is, it's atypical. <laughs> we want you involved. We need farmers involved who are doing things like that. I said, sure. So we went to Washington in September. We participated in the conference. And we wanted to commit, too. That was the purpose of bringing in, 
you know, corporations like Google, Cisco, et cetera, to come in and commit to, you know, knocking hunger out by 2030. So we committed to feeding uh, a million people in our state by 2025 and also committed on the policy side too. Mm -hmm. We want to translate again, going back to the programs, start small, look at the data and scale up. So this year, um, I'm excited to announce because today was our last delivery. We probably fed about a half a million people in our state. And it's only through, you know, God's grace that we had this much yield. So in June, we were going to lose 90% with the drought. Mm. And we were forced to say, look, because while we insure our crops, we were like, you know, there's a lot of people who are not going to get our food. Mm. And I'm not kidding you. I'm a faithful man. I'm a deacon in my church. And so I got down on my knees like Elijah and prayed and I said, all right, Lord, whatever you want, make it happen. And three days later, eight and a half inches of rain came, which was the amount in one day for two months. A couple of days later, we had seven and a half inches. A couple of days later, we got eight and a half inches. And so in March, you plan out, okay, what's the max yield we could get for this season? We 2X'd it this year. Wow. We 2X that max yield. And instead of selling it, we said, you know what? The food insecurity in our state, 1.4 million people are hungry in our state. 400,000 are children. We need to feed them. So we, we fed them. We, so we literally were delivering on our two semi trucks up and down the state. Our corn gets into Eastern Iowa, Eastern Missouri, Western Indiana. And we fed, you know, and, and created, uh, an operation that's really providing a lot of food, but also leading by example. Yeah. It's, it's been tremendous. I wonder, wonder if, uh, there are any other people within the black and brown community that are interested in farming? Oh and my gosh. You could, probably, you could probably show them away. Well, short answer is yes. Okay. The, the, the issue in, in the BIPOC community is getting access, not only to the land, yeah. but to the materials right. because they are resource people, people in lower socioeconomic communities are resourceful mm-hmm. and they can grow. They just need that, um, first step in that they need good dirt, number one. Mm-hmm. It's hard. In these communities, there is no farmland, and whatever there is, it's not good dirt. So you need to provide them, you know, in terms of that uh, area. But in urban communities, you need just smaller land, and you think vertically, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So that's why there are a lot of vertical farms, hydroponics, things like that that you can grow in your backyard now. And the dirt is there. It's good. And what you can do is start to grow enough to where you can start to introduce fresh food systems within the actual neighborhoods and on the streets, Mm -hmm. which is amazing. Community gardens, too. We need to expand that. And and our governor has been wonderful about that, providing a lot of, you know, capital. So to not only push urban farming, but also to help grocery stores, Mm -hmm. especially in rural communities. Because if you look at it proportionally, the rural areas actually have far worse food insecure statistics Mm. than you would see in in the area. And quite frankly, it's it's actually worse because you just have such long distances of food deserts, okay, uh, food apartheids, right? So in these rural communities, sometimes you can go twenty, thirty miles yeah. without a without a sure any access to fresh food. Yeah. So that's um, what we're passionate about. I mean, look, at the end of the day, food is medicine. We've written some legislation that's still sitting there in the Senate that will create. 200 million new meals annually. So as you had alluded to, this, what I'm doing is expensive. No farmer can do what I'm doing because it's too expensive. So how can can you incentivize a farmer and give them tax credits? So for example, if you donate a pallet of corn to a food bank, give them the dollar for dollar tax credit that they deserve. Not only harvesting it with the labor, but also transporting it. So what I devised is that um, I wrote a law. It's called the Illinois Farmers Who Fight Food, Illinois Farmers Who Fight Hunger Act. And so if you're a farmer and you donate like what we do, whether it's your specialty crop or even yield equivalent, even if you have just soybeans, you can go down, pick your soybeans, weigh it. They cut you a check. If you donate that check to a food bank, you get a dollar for dollar tax credit up to 2K. Now what that does is the food banks have this cool thing where they can make a meal out of 10 cents just how they leverage the procurement. So if Illinois is known for farmers, so... What's a meal? A meal is, you know, there are varying ways to classify a meal, but basically it's a weight 
of food, right? And so that's how you can really judge how many meals. Certain aspects of like nutritional value. Yep, exactly right. Yeah, basically like kilocalories, what where it's coming from too. And so if ten percent of farmers participate in my program, we'll generate two hundred million meals, based Mm. on how much food or donations. I'm sure you'd want to if you haven't already, if you had the time, but like. Met, went door to door to farmers and like in, like introduced this idea and this concept to them or we have and we've talked you know being a member of the illinois farm bureau the soybean growers association corn growers association we've talked to a lot of farmers and each of them have said hmm i definitely would be interested in doing that if it's a dollar for dollar tax credit yeah. you know deductions are one thing because you're really dealing with like you know four to ten percent on the dollar this is a dollar for dollar and you can carry it over for five years. Is there any possibility in the future to increase that cap of 2000 I would love to. Yeah. And we wanted to do that, except, yeah. it, it, again, you have to look at how much the state is willing to spend. Work, working uh, on several occasions now with, with the budgets and things like that, Have you? is there money just sitting somewhere that needs to be allocated? I think it's interesting because... When we talk about budgets, and, and, you know, this year's budget was, what, like $51 billion, right? If you look at it, and I'm probably one of the few people that went through the budget because I tried to get my bill put into what's called the Budget Implementation Program, the BIMP. And when the budget comes out, it's like 400 pages, and it lists every program that's in the budget. Mm-hmm. So you don't know if your program got put in unless you actually go through it. Oh, my God. So I actually read it. And so you'd be surprised at what money is being spent in different districts, right? Whether it's for pickleball courts or different oh sort of things. Oh, I mean, <laughs> some of the programs are wild. And unfortunately, my our program didn't get put in there. And, you know, as a lot of other programs that are very near and dear to people didn't get put in there either, yeah. right? Because, you know, for us, it's like, well, how can you not feed people? Another person could say, well, how can you not, you know, have this clinic? Or do you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, so, yeah. yeah. But but really, I think that you hit the nail on the head, right? Like, these large budgets tend to have some waste or food or, or funds that are just not being used in an effective way, right? Because yeah. government is a, a large entity. You know, the, the, the federal government is the largest employer in the United States. We have to realize that these are large, you know, entities that are under an umbrella, and sometimes it's inefficient. I think that we need to have, you know, legislators and policy people and executors in government that work consistently through areas that have wasteful spending or not being spent and make sure that that capital gets put forth into areas that are meaningful, that get a, get an ROI, right? A return mm-hmm. on investment. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, the, the empowerment and growth of the community. And, and that's really, I mean a good segue as to, you know, my frustrations because, you know, I've I've been fortunate to, you know, create policy and pass policy as a private citizen. Not many people get to do what I've done, Mm -hmm. right? Write laws and pass them as a private citizen, but it's not easy. And I can only do that maybe one or two max during a session that takes place between January and May in Springfield, right? Because you know, helping. What do you mean? You have to write it there or like, how does that? Well, work? here, so you have to have lobbyists, number one. So you have to pay for that. Two, you have to get the key people and, who are involved. And just for, for my own ignorance, like when you say get lobbyists, you're, right. you're paying people to champion your ideas? Yes, or? that's exactly right. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Like, cause you can't just, you can't just go in there and you just can't. like, <laughs> no, uh, that's not how government works. Unfortunately, our government, both in the state and the federal level. So is there a lot of whining and dining in this, uh, I, you know, it's interesting because, you know, when I came with the Mike Hill Moultrie Act, you know, it was, I didn't have any interest. It wasn't like selfish interest. Like I wanted to pay for funerals and have the state assist in that. That was the goal. That's mm-hmm. it. Any piece of legislation that I'm writing, I don't have an interest in terms of me personally for financial gain or anything in the realm of my cohort or friends or family, et cetera. Like I'm only focused on people's pain. The 200 million meals that are created, I'm focused solely on those who are in food apartheid or hungry people, adults and kids. And and that's that's a key issue, I think, that when you're talking about whining and dining, et cetera, like a lot of legislation that's written have 
you know, interests by many different parties. If you pass this bill, we get richer, mm. you know? Mm. And I think that, um, you know, we need to be cognizant of that too, you know? There are very powerful lobbying groups, especially in Washington, right? Yeah. So the healthcare lobbyists, and we've heard, you know, consistently from like the NRA and how powerful these lobbyists can be to impact what legislation gets passed mm. and what doesn't. And I think we need to be cognizant of that because that really dictates what legislative laws are being written on the federal and our state side. Mm. And if you want government to work for you, you need to have, you know, good legislation that comes out. And, you know, we, we, we need to be better at recognizing, you know, those potential conflicts. Mm. So just do, do a little digging. Yeah. I think that helps, I think, but you also need... But how often do lay people read legislation? Very rarely. Yeah. yeah that's exactly right. And I think, but, but once you read it, you, you kind of say to yourself, man, this either doesn't make sense, like, wh why are we doing this? Or you say, man, this is a great idea. Why can't we do more? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's a big thing, and, and I do want to touch on one point, too. Passing legislation is one thing. But that doesn't stop there. Mm. You need to make sure it's funded and it's implemented. Mm. Just because I passed a bill that paid for children's burials, that doesn't mean I need to stop. I need to make sure that my law is funded and that it's implemented. And that's not easy to do is as a that private on citizen. An annual basis, monthly basis. So it's an annual it's an annual fund, but it's and and that is was graciously provided by the DHS having a uh, capital allocation for this. And it's a rolling basis, right? So as families need the money, they mm. distribute that money and the comptroller writes the checks to the family. He signs the checks, right? And there's a, there's a quality control, uh, you know, process where you're not, you know, double dipping and cheating, right? Are they, so I know you previously mentioned in bypassing the family going straight to the cemetery. Yes. Is that still the case? So or? what happens is I created this paperwork. Basically, it's one form. And you, the family takes it to each of the vendors, and they will sign it, you attach the receipts, and then you send that to the DHS who verifies it. And then you, you have a total amount that's due, right? Because you don't, if you, if you spend less than 10000 you know, the state can provide you less. And so that amount gets approved, and then the comptroller directly writes gotcha. the check back. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. But yeah. And to, still, to the vendors. Still not a reimbursement, though. No, they just give no. the receipt. Yeah, you give the receipt, the family does. Yeah, yeah. So and and then so the the, the state is paying the vendors, okay, right? Okay. So you're the vendors are basically right. giving the opportunity for the families, right? Cuz repayment so the the payments, the direct payments from the state to the vendors takes some time. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't happen overnight, but the burial does. Burial is, has to be done within, you know, typically 7 to 10 days. So we need to facilitate that, and that's the real onus of the program. But but here's my point: Why do we have to stop there? Mm. Like, why do we have to to stop at children under seventeen who've been killed by a firearm? Why can't we expand the program? Yeah. Why can't we help adults? Why can't we help other people? Right to a degree yeah. of. You know, so, so I've heard of groups that do it like sure. for more for emotional support or mm -hmm. like how to move forward if you were paralyzed or victim of gun violence and they vis visit you in the hospital. And hopefully the uh, another goal is to limit retaliation and s stuff like that. But there are a handful of groups that like Aclavis and absolutely. And, yeah, that, that are working on and that. these programs are essential to dealing with trauma. Yeah. Um, but but, you know, we've been going back to this process of you know yeah. me trying to just put forth a law every session it's hard and i say to myself man you got to go through lobbyists a through j to just get 10 minutes to speak with the legislature legislator who's helping you or at least sponsoring your bill because they have other bills too right and i'm like man if i was only in that position i could write 15 bills because i got a lot of great ideas wow uh you know, and as a champion for, you know, women's reproductive rights, mm. we need to have, you know, we need to put forth a constitutional amendment protecting that. And as a person who, you know, is really involved in food insecurity, that's just the appetizer. My main course is something even far better. 
that helps climate change and we got to create more jobs. And there are a lot of things that I have ideas for. And that really got me thinking to say, look, I could be doing a lot more on a bigger scale of helping our communities if I was allowed the opportunity to write and pass laws directly. And I firmly believe that those who are in power should be closest to the pain. You need to be empathetic. You need to be around this level of pain in order to understand what our communities are going through. And I've, and I've done that both from a healthcare setting, both from, you know, paying for and, and, and really trying to be uh, a a beacon of hope for people who've lost their kids. But as, as, as in that position, is it, I feel like it's easy to lose sight of that because of how bogged down with paperwork you you lose you lose the human side of it. Do you yeah. feel like is, is it going to be a full time job if you get this? Yes. If you become senator. Yeah. So um, the incumbent stepped down a few months ago in our Senate district, and talking with my wife and the children too, because that's the first people you need to ask and yeah. talk about you know the sacrifices and how difficult this is and. My wife and kids looked me in the eye and they're like, dad, if you don't run for this, we're going to be upset with you. Wow. And so uh, when the incumbent stepped down a few weeks ago, um, it triggered a special election. And so March 19th, 2024 is a special election for the Senate, state Senate seat in the 20th district. And we look at it as an open race and we announced our candidacy uh, for the state Senate position a short time ago. Uh, and we are taking our experiences, taking our, uh, you know, policy achievements, uh, achievements in providing health care, free health care, providing food, um, you know, helping those who are in pain, but also as a champion for women's reproductive rights mm-hmm. and inclusivity. And to, but to also just say, look, we've created jobs. You know, we know what it's like to push our communities forward rather than backwards. We have been a part of our community in our 20th district for years on the ground, looking at people's pain and being with, with those who are experiencing it and how to reduce it. Mm. And we feel strongly that uh, not only are we the best qualified, but we would serve the people in a way that is absolutely indicative of what, comes with the job yeah so is it a lot of paperwork yeah is it a lot of time is it a lot of stress sure but these are things that we've been you know we, we've 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 done for the for the purpose of helping people mm-hmm. i think that's expected of us right service is a is an obligation it's not a privilege mm. we need to have that mentality again going back to the good neighbor mentality yeah so that's what we're, we're excited for so we've you know, we have our campaign team now, we have our office it's over in Avondale, and we encourage people to check out our website, drdave.drdavenyack.com. Uh, and, you know, we put people first. I, th- I think you need a media person. I think uh, as, as much as you post, I think you need someone making your own, making con- like their sole job is to record and produce and share content. Um, so that's one less thing you have to worry about. I agree. Yeah. And one of the things I'm, you know, becoming more comfortable with just given how much we've done, you know, keeping the circle tight is to, you know, have people around you to help you with these things, to yeah. allow them to really help you focus on just knocking doors and raising money. Cause that's really what it takes to win local elections. And we've knocked on so many doors. Mm. And what I've learned is this, people are frustrated People are frustrated that people get in power and they're all talk and very little action. We are, we, we walk the talk. To the point where you, you, you kind of lose hope? Yes. Learned helplessness. Mm. Where you just say, well, another cycle has come and gone in Chicago politics. Let's just elect somebody who's, you know, part of the machine or yeah. won't really do much for me. And we're not like that. Well, it's very easy to, to to say things like that, especially when you they're not in front of you and you're not having a conversation yeah. with them. I, I don't know the current mayor. I've never met him, uh, Mr. Brandon. Um, but he's getting a lot of flack for all the migrants that are filling up the police stations. 
and know, and or all the gun violence that's going on. It's a humanitarian crisis of epic proportions. You know, I had a colleague who said, "Dave, go check out the police, you know, stations." And we went in there, and it's 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 terrible. And so we ended up saying, "Look, we've done free clinics before. Let's just open up a triage tent. We can get you know." our new neighbors or migrant friends into there, screen them for any sort of, you know, terrible diseases, diabetes, high blood pressure, look at the kids, make sure they're okay if they yeah. need to go to the hospital. So we did that. We have a free clinic. Uh, it's in a tent. Uh, that's a that's a commercial tent. It's a big tent. We've had some wonderful joint clinics with other providers that uh, see some of the... Um, some of the migrants in the police stations, we get them over there, we screen them, and then, you know, we try to get them any sort of, you know, immediate care, knowing that they may be resettled and gone. So we want to make sure they get some sort of medical record that they've been seen. Right. But also, given the fact that it's schools coming up, you know, vaccines, just sort of school physicals, things like that, kids need to get back, you know, because they are going to be going to CPS. So kid, so those migrant kids are going to the CPS schools? Yeah. Yeah. If they can get in and, you yeah. know, get, get the necessary work done to get them into the schools. But again, most of them are only Spanish speaking only. So if you're looking at schools, they need to be in, you know, vocational areas that, that adapt to, you know, their language that they, that they speak. So and, I think, yeah, when, when we, when people drive past, let's say a, a busy police station, that's just, a, I feel like it's a snapshot. I feel like different people are coming and going, like they're being moved to other places whether it's like empty buildings around the city or I don't know where, where else are they going? I feel like it's, it's, it's a flow. It's not the same people every time. Yeah. And if you look too, like I mean, resettlement is a very complex mm. generational issue, right? You are talking about work status. You're talking about jobs. You're talking about health, safety. You're talking about, you know, immediate food, shelter, clothing. You know, these are the required um, aspects of getting somebody resettled who mm-hmm. have endured large, long, arduous journeys from, you know, difficult circumstances. And so I think it is very naive to think that this is going to just go away on its own mm-hmm. and very quickly. We need to understand that we must incorporate both NGO and federal government partnerships to really understand the scope of what needs to be done to help our new neighbors Mm. and if we don't have that empathic but pragmatic view this will continue to worsen and we have to step up as good neighbors but realize that you know while communities are so so you know philanthropic to help these families and individuals it's just not enough we need to have the resources that FEMA has, that NGOs have, in order to actually move that needle. Yeah. I feel like the Red Cross would step in, let's say, like, a, a building w- uh, got on fire and people were displaced and they had Hurricanes. To, hurricanes. Yeah. What about Hawaii? $700 per person? Right. In Maui? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah, and I, and I think that's another aspect of government that we need to improve on right right? is the fact that during these natural disasters and you know we don't may not have enough time to talk about climate change in general but the fact is is that these natural disasters will be more frequent yeah warmer waters warmer temperatures i mean look we've had extreme changes in weather you know and that's not well firstly it's becoming more normal Secondly, you know, our, our, our earth is on fire, literally, and we need to bring the temperature down. And so I have a plan for that, especially here on a local level. I'm excited to roll out that policy initiative uh, during our campaign because we need to protect our society and our earth for our children and their children. And And that's really why you look at, you know, bettering our communities right when you have a child it it just changes your life where you look at them in such a different way and a different framework of the world right because you see so much in them now you know and and to protect them and and hope that they live a fulfilling life 
And in order to do that, you realize that that really centralizes around the community, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's really what we're trying to get at here. You know, not necessarily directly for, you know, my children, but all of our children. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I look at the children I treat in my clinic, the children I feed uh, with our corn and our, our green beans, and, you know, even the children that we've lost and that we help bury, that they are our future. And we can learn from them, but we need to protect that future. Yeah. Um, one last thing about the migrants, like meeting these migrants, what's been your pulse on their perspective on things. I guess like how, how bad was the situation they're running from that they're willing to put up with the stuff that they're putting up with right yeah. now? Yeah. I think so in any sort of humanitarian crisis, you're going to get bad actors, right? So mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, those that come here and can disrupt, you know, the cohort, right? And you have to be very cognizant of that too. And yeah. I think, that's important when you are look I think there was a time where even the homeless people wouldn't be allowed to sleep in police stations. Right. When, even exactly when the weather, right. the, the temperature dropped. Yeah. And, 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 you know, again, as I said before, there are many people who have resided in our communities for many years who are in need of help, who feel that they have been abandoned because we are helping you know, a newly arrived person from a foreign country. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's understandable. It's like, how is one life worth more than another life? Exactly right. Yeah. And that's an understandable frustration. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, we have to look at everybody as a human being, right? And that the value of each human being is equal. Regardless of who you are, what your status are, your race, your color, your creed, doesn't matter. Everybody's equal. We have to find ways that to... Because they are, because every human being is unique too. And we have to find different ways of how we can help them. I understand what other residents and community, uh, you know, individuals and families believe sometimes too. But at the end of the day, they're here. They're our new neighbors. We have to embrace that, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. not as if, you know, you can, you, you can use them as a political football, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just that that's, that's abhorrent. And so I think what we need to do is to create a system that is, uh, you know, efficient in terms of resettling, right? To get them the jobs and the, the shelter and the food and the resources that they need. And we can't do that in a very fragmented silo way. We need to have broad-based groups like FEMA, like NGOs, to really come in and to help. Curious if they've even stepped in at all. I'm not sure. I think that they've done this in a limited capacity right now. It's the end of August. I am certain that this will get worse to the point where we are going to need that. Mm. Um, and, and, and I think that that is something that is a testament to leadership, right? We need to be open to work with people. Even if you professionally or personally disagree with somebody, I'm going to sit down with you. I'm going to break bread with you. We're going to have some things in common. We're going to have other things we're not. But we're gonna we're gonna try to hash things out for the betterment of our community. I think that's imperative. And and many times now, you know, groups and people camp out on their own islands. If you're not with them, you're against them. And that's not a that's not an attitude and a behavior. Maybe that's coming from fear, right? We yeah, do that, yes. But but we also do it from the hurt effect and groupthink. Yeah, yeah. Because you yeah, know we like media to media can be like right? great sometimes and then just yeah. awful other times. Yeah, we can. But, but I think, you know, if we're going to really step up and help our communities, we have to come together. And that means, you know, as a, as a community, as a group, regardless of our political ideals, regardless of our religious ideals, and fundamentally look at people and their pain and to say, look, I can help you in your pain by doing this and that. And we can work together to do that. And if we can, what then I realized is that people who were in pain, who have it reduced, end up really wanting to help others mm -hmm. who are in pain. Because they knew what it's like. So, so I'll give you a great story. There's a group that I work with called Purpose Over Pain. It's mm -hmm. a group of moms and dads who have come together, who have all lost their children to gun violence over the many decades. And now their sole cause 
is to be that group within minutes. They have a cell phone that you can call even an hour after you've lost your child to help get referrals to pastoral care, a meal train. Mm. If you need to see a doctor because this is just so such overwhelming trauma to talk to, that was born out of pain, right? And this is what they're doing. And that's really what I've seen, that if you help reduce somebody's pain, Again, you start to focus on other people because you're not focusing on yourself. Sure. And I think that's really this purpose that we have, for at least for me, is to do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, Dr. Dave, one last thing. With everything you're accomplishing, how have you found uh, it to balance everything, whether it's <laughs> boundaries or time management for you and yours? Yeah. No, it's uh, that's a great question. Um. I will tell you that I'm an early riser, mm. uh, 4 a.m., and it's before the kids get up and before the dogs start barking and wanting to go outside, and it's a it's a really deeply personal time for me. I spend about an hour and a half to two, two hours, if I'm lucky, uh, praying, reading my Bible, writing in my gratitude journal, and meditating, and then I work out. Sometimes some calisthenics. As the body gets older, you start to realize that... <laughs> can't do as much you know but really some strength training maybe some cardio but it's i don't miss a day wow and it's important because it really provides spiritual healing and faith are really important to me it really leads my life and what i do and what i hope to do and it reinforces that and and you know there are things like you know bible study group and fellowship among other people that are, you know, have similar mindsets too in that re- respect too. And I, and that's honestly why I really, you know, applaud and respect different faiths too. Because I think faith is important, mm-hmm. whatever faith that is, to help you carry through difficult times in life. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the areas that we work in are not easy. It really requires a lot of resilience. I always say, you got to get comfortable hugging the cactus. Mm. And mm. that requires yeah, a lot of intestinal fortitude. Mm. And you get that from, you know, being strong in your faith and just taking that time to meditate. And I mean, you, we all know the physiologic benefits, right? Yeah. It's proven scientifically, but psychologically it's important too. And, and we've known, right, through COVID that these uncertain times can really cause psychological, yeah. emotional, and physical consequences. Mm. And if you don't really put forth an effort in self-care, it's going to be hard. Secondly, I had an amazing family. My wife and my kids, my wife's my best friend. We've been together. She was, I was 19. She was 18. We met at Cornell and we've been together ever since. And She's just my rock, my best friend, my encourager, and is there, you know, when things are difficult, you know? Because, so, yeah, I'll be honest, it's a lonely path out there. In politics, you know, being a candidate, it's very lonely. You know, being on the farm, delivering corn, is, sometimes it can get lonely. But I will tell you, uh, there's a difference between being lonely and being alone. Mm. I love being alone. And more recently, since we've started doing all of these things over the last few years, I enjoy being alone, but I've never felt lonely. Hmm. And so, yeah, that's uh, just having a supportive family. And we have three dogs, too. And I will tell you that there are dog owners and then there's everybody else. I I have this joke. I say, look, if dogs don't go to heaven, then I don't want to go either, (laughs) you know. And just the unconditional love that they provide and... Um, you know, they greet you in the morning as if they haven't seen you in three weeks, but I was like, Hey man, I just saw you like a few minutes ago. You know (laughs) what I mean? And, um, but they're a really great outlet for, you know, just taking a break from things, you know? And I think that's important for self-care too, is to do what you, you love to do. Uh, if you're lucky enough, it won't be work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like in sense, like, you know, like everything's work, right? Right. Every, everything's definitely work. Even if you enjoy it in the beginning, but yeah. there's going to be things that you never thought you'd have to do in order to make your dreams come true. It's, it's going to feel like work. I agree. And, and, you know, uh, especially, you know, in Chicago in politics, mm. right. Uh, it didn't get the, 
nicknamed Windy City for nothing. Oh, man. And we're expecting a tough race. Yeah. And we're going to put everything on the table to bring our message to the voters to say, look, we need change. We need people who, you know, really lead and to have action and not just empty rhetoric mm-hmm. anymore. People yeah. are tired of that. And you really have to look at people now, especially candidates, to see what have they done? What have they truly done or what are they offering? Because I'm going to take the guy or the gal or whoever who's done work and who has results, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, I've fed hundreds of thousands of people. I've cared for people without any expectation of any return. That's the type of people, that's the type of person people are wanting right now. And and we feel we are the best qualified to do that. Mm. Dr. Dave, I got nothing else. I feel like we talked about everything. <laughs> we have. And I'm we sure have. we could talk about more. Um, we just passed two, two hours. Oh, man, it didn't even feel like that. It never does. Yeah. <laughs> I, I honestly, from the bottom of my heart, I just can't thank you enough for inviting me and talking about really important issues, not only to myself, but what we feel to the community too, and to highlight some things that are not really talked about. Yeah. You know, Agreed. And, and I've never talked about them in, in ways that I think hopefully, you know, your listeners can, can learn more too and get involved. I, you know, I'd be remiss to not mention, you know, strength to love.org is our website uh, Strength to Love Foundation. It's uh, you know it's our free clinic. We help people with burials. Our farm is called Nyack Farms. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can follow us at, at Nyack Farms, uh, NyackFarms.com. And then you know the the Dr. Dave for state senator. It's mm-hmm. a big it's a big race. I think it's going to be one of the more followed races in the state this cycle. Uh, Dr. Dave Nyack.com. Follow us on our you know handles too. We appreciate that and you can learn more about our campaign. We're it's a civic minded campaign. We want Kids from high school, college, you know, come and knock doors with us, make phone calls, volunteer. I mean, we want to we wanna build something longer term so that people can, you know, feel that their leaders are really listening to them and acting on their concerns and pain. And, and that's really singularly what we're focused on. I wonder if you ever considered, like, aldermen or, like, any – that's something – not as you know you just kind of like i feel like you skip <laughs> <laughs> i will say this you know having worked in the state legislature in a private citizen capacity yeah. working with other senators right because uh-huh. my because a lot of my work has been done in the senate yeah senator collins sponsoring my michael moultrie act uh senator dave kaler and dale fowler sponsored by illinois farmers who fight hunger act uh you know i have a an aggressive policy yeah. agenda, even as a private citizen this session too. I think we're going to probably have five bills I'm going to be wow. working on as a private citizen. So if you look... It's, you know, it's very fitting. Right, well... What you're doing. Though. Yeah, I mean, you're scaling up, yeah. right? You yeah. got it, and you learn how to do it, and you do it effectively. So, yeah, I mean, but again, it'd be easier in the seat having 15 every session and to get to know people. So, you know, when looking, but also a lot of life is just timing. Right? The senator stepped down. Yeah. It's an open seat. Right. Why not? You see what I'm saying? And yeah. and I ain't getting any younger. Mm. I'm 43, and time is our most precious asset. And we've been blessed to where we have the support and the means to do it. So yeah. let's do it. Yeah, I, 100%. 100%. <laughs> is there anything you're scared of? I feel like you're so steadfast. You're so, you know, you're so <laughs> positive. You're so optimistic. I, I'll tell you, um, one of my biggest fears is, you know, being a failure as a dad. Wow. Yeah. I think that when you have kids, there was a time, I, I haven't even talked really about losing mom, but um, my mom passed away from leukemia, acute leukemia, 2016. And I cared for her during the latter stages of her illness where she was a paraplegic. And, uh, it impacted me in terms of, you know, finding health, help, help and durable medical equipment and looking at her. And my, my mom was a real tough lady, mm. let me tell you. And I had my children, they were only very young at that time. And so it's like a new father, but also losing a parent is sort of this odd, the time scale just sort of escalated really what 
most people experience in their 50s or 60s, I was experiencing in my mid-30s. Yeah, the, the fragility of life. Yes, yeah. exactly right. And I, I, I became very fearful, one, of death, mm-hmm. two, as naturally, but, but seeing somebody lose who's so dear to you, their life it makes you scared, but then also the burden of knowledge, being a doctor too, you're just like, oh man. But but really it was this sort of, man, I really don't want my kids to look at me as a failure. In in the realm of like, dad wasn't there for me, or because mm, mm. I, I always want to foster an environment where if they have any problems, they can come to me. And that, um, and a lot of that just has to be done through communication. Right? Like sometimes you physically don't have to be there? Well, I think the understanding that, you know, some of the work that we do requires us to be in the community and not at home. Yeah, right. And that those are sacrifices. Right, right. But I will say, I involve my children in this mm. so that we do this. So, for example, you know, on the Saturday clinics I have, my kids are there with me. Oh, cool. They come in, they see the patients with me, they get to, you know, strap on the blood pressure cuff, take the vitals. When we're delivering corn, they're there. When they're, even on some, you know, with the campaign, we, we kind of like to keep a more, you know, tight circle, because sure. they are children. But any sort of, you know, humanitarian or community event, I want them to be there for knowing that uh, a lot of things are bigger than they are. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that they can understand to say, oh, my dad did a lot. And so, but I just, there's a balance, right? When you're a busy dad like I am, you want to make sure you're there, but also you don't really know how that's going to affect them longer term. Because yeah. so many times we have a tendency to pass on intergenerational pathology to our kids. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're Asian. I'm Asian. Was, was there was there a right? point where you realized you were becoming closer to your parents than you thought you would well, want to become? <laughs> it's interesting because, like, you know, my parents were Indian immigrants. So, like, if you weren't a doctor, engineer, or a lawyer, you were like a failure. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, but you know, honestly, I don't fault them for that. I I think that that's yeah. you know. Not uncommon in other cultures. their understanding of success and stability. Exactly right. Yeah. But now, you know, for me, success is really defined on, you know, joy, Mm. what you feel, you know, when you're doing something, Um, service, Mm. right? Are you bettering the community? Like, did you have an improvement on an area in your community when, after you've left it, mm, right? Mm. That's really how we should judge success too, right? Like whether it's a garden, whether it's, you know, classroom, whatever it is. Did you did you improve it in some way after you left? Mm. I think that should be this sort of barometer of success now. And did it make you happy? And I really advise, you know, when I'm now, I, I actually, I teach at my alma mater at Cornell. I'm a visiting lecturer there. And so I'll go back and, talk to the freshmen and I teach a graduate level course too and uh, come in as like a guest lecturer and it's amazing to see the unbridled like quench and thirst of our younger generation to do well and to obtain knowledge. It's amazing. Yeah. But we're up against this, you know, wall of you know, figuring out what is truth Mm. and then how that relates to, you know, your core ethics. Yeah. Truth in the sense of like, does it dwindle their almost idealistic or romantic view of like changing the world? Well, like for example, I was uh, talking after class to a bunch of really motivated Cornell, like, you know, juniors and seniors. What what class is this? Uh, So I taught, uh, um, Nonprofit social innovation. Whoa, okay. And then we also talked about, um, you know, food justice and supply chain issues too. Mm. I, I taught a class on that and we went through, you know, farming and supply chain issues that cool. we did too. But, you know, I talked to a group and they're very motivated and they were like, well, I got, you know, five extracurricular activities and I'm doing this and that. And, I'm, and I, I said, hey, stop for a second. <laughs> like, what? Five, five clubs you're in and doing this, I said, what if you just had 
one or two and the time that you saved on the other four you actually just spend some quality time with your friend your girlfriend or rock climbing or you know what i mean like yeah. bettering yeah. like just to add a longer yeah. resume well, and then order. what if they're like i do like yeah <laughs> right but 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 that's now you know this sort of thing is that like okay i gotta pile on the plate exactly resume right. resume mm-hmm. things resume right? padding and yeah. it's not really like i'd rather quantity over quality exactly right and that's scary because you know you really want more character development if you're spreading yourself too thin do you really understand like who you are you're not getting deep yeah yeah and that's really the essence of this critical time in college or if you even if you don't go to college right like you know working and getting experiential processes is so vital yeah and to figure out like what is your purpose mm-hmm. and and meaning in life and so that's really the advice i give is that you gotta really try to do things that make you joyful because happiness and joyful are two different things and really serve serve in your community and make it better those are the two big things that i would really like to leave you know your listeners today with yeah yeah that's solid that always happens i'm like that's all i got and we go on for like another 20 minutes um dave we're lucky to have you as a neighbor oh my man i just I'm so humbled and honored to be a part of our community here and to see what's on the horizon. And I'm hopeful. I'm optimistic. Good. Trust me. I, I think that we have such a good group of people who and who really want to better our community, except we're just against these forces mm. that are so difficult to overcome that we can only do that together. Mm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what would you tell someone uh, about voting if they've never really voted? Well, firstly, if you don't vote for me, just vote. Mm. Vote, vote, vote. It is a wonderful process and so sacred. So for years, I take my children to vote with me. And even in primaries and generals, we take them because I want them to feel like what it's like to to go into a precinct, to get your ballot, to go back and to, you know, exhibit a civic responsibility because that is really how we seminally affect change, right? Because our vote matters so much because that is who we put in office to represent us. And over time, again, we go back to this learned helplessness, right? I don't want to vote or people can't vote because we've systemically, you know, um, created hurdles Mm. so that they can't vote. And we can go through with, you know, for example, felons. Mm -hmm. Do we really need to create that stigma? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After they've served their time to prevent them from voting? Give me a break. Uh, You you, you see what I'm saying? Or, Or, you know, path to citizenship. Yeah. You know, so that you can vote. I mean, these are critical things. And so what I would have to say to somebody, especially somebody who's about to turn 18, that your vote is equivalent to a 75-year-old multi-billionaire. It's the same. That's a good way to think about it. It's the same. Wow. And I want people to realize, like, that is what the beauty is about, you know, free elections and that, your vote does have significance in in what happens not only in your neighborhood, but all the way into our nation. And that we're again into a presidential cycle. And a participatory system is required uh, in order to make change. Do you ever think it's going to become digital or electronic? You know, ideally, and this is easily probably hacked, but what if it's just like, the political version of Tinder and yeah. you're kind of just swiping left and right on things and um, you're increasing access um, and uh, ease. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure it's already easy, right? right? But like it could be easier. So I'm going to ask this one question. Do you think more people would vote on a Sunday afternoon or on a Tuesday in the middle of winter when they're at work or <laughs> stuck in their home? Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like there were long lines on a Tuesday, but probably Sunday. 
Exactly right. <laughs> now, look, I am an absolute fan of early voting. Yeah, get them done. It's empty, you know yeah. where where we can get people registered early, so you don't even have to leave your house on that Tuesday. Mm. But I agree with you. I think we need to do more, a tremendous amount more, to increase voter access. Yeah, we need to get people registered, and my my team can help with that too. If you have any questions about, you know, how do I register to vote? Uh, you know reach on out because we have a wonderful team that can walk you through that but also you know developing a plan you know what i mean this is really critical you know that if you really take that civic duty seriously and you have transportation issues or you got to get a day off or time off from work and you got to talk to your supervisor and you know these are things that are protected Mm. but but a lot of times in you know areas here in um our society, it, it disenfranchises people, right? Mm. I can't get off or it's too far, mm-hmm. right? My precinct, I can't get there or even knowledge of where do I vote? Yeah, You know what I mean? I think these educational uh, yeah. and initiatives can be better. Yeah. I do. Yeah. There's so many facets to tackle. Uh, you know, they, they could outsource some type of marketing to a marketing agency or just like change the culture around voting. Um, I, I agree. I, think, I mean, I think there's still many people within the 20s and 30s that just feel like it doesn't matter. Right. And on top of that, you know, it goes back to this sort of like, well, what am, what can I do? Well, you can vote. And what happens is that you or have... maybe a, in the sense it's rigged. Yes. You know, I will be candid. The foundation of our country is based on free elections. Mm-hmm. And we have to have a level of trust that the entities in government will upheld that that are outlined in our constitution and i'm a firm believer in that and that's what the wonderful beautiful part about this wonderful country and city and state we live in look i am a child of immigrants who is a doctor and a farmer who said you know what i want to run for senate Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do it in what, you know, dream or, or movie or realm of society is that, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and, yeah. and it's because we live in America. I live in Illinois and I live in Chicago. It's just unbelievable. And, you know, sometimes I got to pinch myself, but that's, that, that's the one thing I truly am grateful for is that we, because in other nations around the world, you can't do that. Right. You cannot and I think if people understood that, you know, it's, it's sometimes that sort of you don't really know how good you have it until it's gone. Right. Right? Yeah. Mentality. People don't realize how good we have it here, yeah. that they can vote in a free election. They're, they're representative to advocate and write policy for them. It's the truth. And look, I understand how politics are politics, but at the end of the day... We have to have faith in that system Mm. or the entirety of our country's fabric will break down. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. My man, Victor, (laughs) this is, this is a blast. I I can't thank you enough. I appreciate you. I appreciate your listeners. I appreciate everything that you're doing to get people's stories out there so we can learn more about our society and just the direction of where we're going. So thanks brother. Likewise, Dave, keep doing what you're doing. You got a fan lifelong supporter a friend a neighbor um and uh hopefully yeah if we get feedback i'll definitely share any of that feedback with you i appreciate Um, that we've already shared where people can find you but uh we'll be paying attention and spreading the good word and go vote yeah we'll vote go vote good luck to you dr dave um everyone else thanks for tuning in that was two and a half hours (laughs) uh till the next time um stay curious thanks my friend